everyone is still buzzing about his Golden Globe red carpet look. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the judge. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing with a friend. Welcome back, Sarah Tiana, to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Always good to see you. Uh, she's got a very funny stand-up special that is uh, out on YouTube as we speak called 44, and you can just go to YouTube mm-hmm. and find it. Yeah. <laughs> because it's funny and it's uh, it's light-lifting. It's only a half hour. Yeah, very easy. Long. <laughs> very, um, very Adele of you to just name it after your uh-huh. age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, age and, and Hank Aaron. And Hank Aaron, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think Bob Saget's last one was zero to sixty, and that was him being sixty, oh. as I as I recall. So you're in good company, or you're doomed. I guess <laughs> we'll have to figure that one out. Only time will tell. Uh, so a lot of scuttlebutt about uh, our friend Joe Coy and the Golden Globes and uh, Taylor Swift. And I know you'd write a lot, and you do a lot of roast battles, and mm. you write. I'm assuming for. You know, Award shows, award sure. Shows a lot and of do sports that. award and shows, I, mostly. But. And I've done my mm-hmm. share of writing for... I, I wrote for the Academy Awards a little bit, but only, you know, only when Jimmy mm-hmm. does it. But now... Well, now that he's coming on his fourth time, I guess I've done it a few times. Yeah. Uh, what was your take? Did you did you see it? Did you hear about it? I saw it, uh, I and I heard about it a lot. Um, I think, you know... Uh, obviously, that's a lose lose situation. It's a tough room. It's like it's the reason so many people say no. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I thought throwing the writers under the bus was a little tough to take as a writer of those shows. Yeah. Oh, did you take uh, personal offense? Yeah, I did because I feel like you know, as the, when you when you are the host, like you you still choose the jokes. Like you might not have written it, but you chose it. Yeah, it's a good point. And yeah, it's, well, it's it's a weird. So there was a conceit yeah. in the middle of it where maybe some of the jokes didn't work that well. Mm-hmm. And then he said, you know, give me a break. Those are the writers. The jokes yeah. I wrote worked. And I think that's why people who write for those shows. Right. Well, Although I never took any offense to it, but I didn't realize, wait a minute, maybe I should take some offense to it. Well, maybe you should. I yeah. should. I mean, I'm not really offended by it. I think, I think, you know, if I was in that situation, I would have jokes prepared for when jokes didn't work well. I mean, mm. I felt like there was an Oppenheimer bombing joke just waiting to oh, be said. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. It's just sitting there, you know? So, like, I felt like, I mean, even in Roast Battle, like, you, you want to try to have uh, things to say whenever someone says something about you that you don't like or just something to kind of fill in the moment. And I felt like he could have... Maybe handled it with with a joke there, mm-hmm. and instead of just saying like "give me a break" and shut up and like. <laughs> yeah. So o- overall, you didn't think it went well. I didn't the think monologue. it went well. Yeah. It's a. I I agree that it's kind of a. It's not a winning proposition. Right. There's certain gigs in comedy that just are inherently tough. Yeah. And sometimes people talk about like corporate gigs, you know, like they go, okay, you got to do 40 minutes, but it's got to be super clean. And we really want to focus on asphalt because most of <laughs> these guys, you know, they spread asphalt for a living. So we keep it kind of asphalt centric and do yeah. about 40 and keep it clean. And, and mm-hmm. don't say anything about politics or something. And you're like, this is diff. Like I'm being hobbled before the foot race begins, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I, I think Golden Globes is, is kind of that. Yeah, I think it also hurts like when you are also part of that business and that industry. So like it's even I feel like the stakes are a little bit higher because like if you are doing an asshole an asshole an asphalt <laughs> corporate event, like you don't also work in asphalt only. Yeah. And uh this is specific cuz I did do an asphalt <laughs> convention. <laughs> It went real well, though. You know, I didn't have to work clean because asphalt right. guys, I mean, the def- oh, they're the, the opposite of God. clean, right? Oh, my God, amazing. And it was the funniest thing because when I was 19 and working on a construction site, um, I a lot of the cement trucks that would pull up to the construction site would say, use cement for your driveways and not asphalt. Like it's better, (laughs) which it is. Yeah, It's a better driveway, but it's more expensive, you know? And I remember being like 19 on a job site and I, and I came up with an asphalt joke. (laughs) 
<laughs> nice. <laughs> but I'd been sitting on it for almost 40 years. <laughs> And I finally got a chance to use it at the asphalt convention, Uh except for the joke was a, it was not a pro asphalt joke. It was pro concrete driveways. So I had to reconfigure it Uh and, uh, and it didn't go well. And I threw a few of my riders under the bus, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Like you're supposed to. Most comedy writers can't fit under a bus, no. to be fair. No, they definitely grew up under there. They're probably pale. Or they're born and, yes, under a bus. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So how would you approach... Uh, oh, by the way, the asphalt joke, which I've said here before, was, was if, if you don't go with like our, you know, Acme asphalt, it'll be your ass and not our fault. That was my asphalt <laughs> yeah. joke I wrote when yeah. I was 19. And sat on still it. Works. Still works. And you still works. Still works. Yeah. That's right. I wish you I'd written your, a few more jokes. You sat on your asphalt for 40 years. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, how would you approach a situation like that? Like, you know, the room's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you know, Ricky Gervais comes up and crushes it every other year. And so mm-hmm. you're kind of following him. Um, what do you, how do you approach it? Like, I, well, first of all, I think you have to sell it. I think the only reason that the NFL Taylor Swift joke didn't work is because he bailed on it. Yeah, I think yes. that was a great joke. I mean, it, yeah. it it should have worked. But by that point, he hadn't endeared himself to the room enough and he hadn't won them over. And I think that part of that is because he started off by saying, I didn't watch any of these movies. Right. And then I locked my, I got the gig and then I started watching them. Right. Right. And and I think you can immediately, if, if I was in his position, I would have talked about all the reasons why they shouldn't have hired me for this, like why I'm underqualified and why I'm not good enough to be in this room. And instead he's like, this was all of our dreams to be up here. And it was like, well, I mean, if you just said you got the, the job 10 days ago, clearly it wasn't anyone else's dream to be up there. So be, be a little more self-deprecating. I think you have to be in that situation. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you couldn't I mean, find Gaffigan. anybody else. You picked me. I don't, I've never seen yeah. a movie. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure. Now it's interesting because you know you don't want to piss off the Swifties because that's that's yeah. an army. But yeah. the Filipinos, I'm here to tell you, are a pretty powerful crew. Yeah. I've experienced it firsthand. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. In what way? Told a few jokes. Okay. You know that weren't complimentary to the culture. Okay. You know what I mean? In the Philippines or uh, just in I kept L- them th- in little Filipino town. I check I, the jokes were said stateside, but they spread <laughs> yeah. throughout the land. Yeah. You know, sure. And um, so that's how I found my way here. I'm I yeah. could be a double agent. And yep. <laughs> there were death threats, and security was necessary. And 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 I I didn't know what to make of it really because mm-hmm. I thought why are the Filipinos like well, all all people so mobilized mm-hmm. you know. And uh, it was just a simple why Filipino asphalt sucks joke, you know. <laughs> it's standard fare. We've all heard it before. <laughs> and and all I remember is John Stewart, of all people, I don't know where I was, but he came up to me or something. He'd heard about it. We had the same, same agent and stuff, and he just goes, you don't fuck with the Filipinos, man. I, yeah. I did that once, and I got <laughs> fucked up too. So you should you should know that. Yeah, he's and still I'm, dead to me. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what he did that got him fucked up by uh, your people, but he got fucked up. I don't even and, know. I don't need to know. And yeah, that's the point. And he's like, do not fuck around with them. And so now I feel like you know the Swifty Nation maybe maybe powerful, but the Filipinos are few, but they're proud. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this could be a battle. Going to be a heck of a fight. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's probably the same amount. Yeah. So we, it's, it's. But I think I I oh sorry go no, ahead. No good. I was I, I think also a big to me uh, when I am in situations like that where I feel like I'm roasting a celebrity or I'm and I'm the one behind the mic. To me, the most careful thing to, that you have to do is a make fun of yourself, but also I'm not writing jokes to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to write a joke that impresses you. I want mm-hmm. you to love the joke about yourself. And th- like, even if it is slightly offensive, you're like, wow, that's a really smart joke. And like that room to me understands smart joke. Like they're, they, they all work in dialogue. They all have, uh, you know, something to say about scripts. So 
to me, you have to, A, take accountability for anything that's not working because that room is full of producers in Hollywood who love to give notes. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. like I think you have to, you, you know, be really super prepared. And obviously, uh, he didn't have a ton of time, but those joke writers were in there working on those jokes. So there's, I know he might have just gotten hired, but though to me, they've been writing it no matter who the host was going to be. Oh, you think they were writing for the show? Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. I never yeah, thought about like that. Yeah, first day in the writer's room, they they had so many jokes to pitch them already. Oh, oh tons. Yeah. Think? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, it works that way, I guess, with Rose, too. Like, yeah. like when I mm-hmm. signed up to do the Alec Baldwin roast, that was only with about a week or something, mm-hmm. lead time, or a, not, not, not a lot of lead time. And I went in and met with the writers, yeah. and they pitched some... Jokes that were just, they just had them, you know, yeah. make, here's some been. Alec Baldwin jokes. I remember when you came in. Oh, you were there. I was okay. there, yeah. Then we there you go. We were so excited that you were doing it. You were great. You were? We were really great on it. Whoa. Yeah, I remember of that. course. Wow. Well, thanks. Well, anytime a, a very good comedian comes in, you're like, oh, they're going to understand jokes. You know, it's a little bit harder when like famous actors or beautiful <sighs> actors come in and they're like, oh. You know, and then you have certain people that just go, I don't even want to know what it means. I'm just going to say it if you think it's funny. And you're like, great, <laughs> that also awesome. works. Yeah, <laughs> I did. You know what? And I, I, now I'm having a recollection because uh-huh. I do remember you from that. And I do remember this and I'll screw his name up. But one thing I did, and it kind of pertains to the Joe Coy thing, is they had a bunch of jokes lined up because – basketball player was it like griffin, griffin. yeah mm-hmm. right griffin mm-hmm. was going before me and they had a whole bunch of jokes about how much he sucked <laughs> because they just assumed the guy's a jock oh uh-huh. he's gonna fucking screw the pooch up there and then i'll have a bunch of jokes referring to how much he sucked you know mm-hmm. and then i was like yeah but he may crush <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to have a whole bunch of jokes about how this guy sucked who was good yeah um, in front of me, or who may have been good mm-hmm. in front of me. And people were like, yeah, you know, he's not going to be good. And I was like, I don't know. He may be good. And then he was good. Yeah, he was good. And I was like, oh, good. I'm glad I didn't <laughs> grab any of those how much he sucks jokes. Yeah, I think you write, We like when we are in there writing, we're writing jokes for every occasion. You know, I remember like on the Rob Lowe roast, I had Ann Coulter. I mean, I had Peyton Manning because I was the only one that knew anything about football. And I had Ann Coulter. And I and Ann wouldn't take any of our stuff. And I had written all these, like, you know, coastal elite, left-wing liberal, like, jokes about all the people in the room. And I knew she was going second to last. So we're, me and Tony Hinchcliffe, who was writing on it, we, we did her script. We had all – and then she was like, no, no, no. And then the day of the roast, I go, hey, Ann, if you get booed, say – um, boo all you want, unlike Rob Lowe, I can handle my booze, right? Which right. is a joke handle about booze, him being right. an alcoholic. Right. And uh, she goes, I'm not going to get booed. And I go, all right, well, have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good night. <laughs> like, well, I'm can't glad. can't do anything at that point. I'm glad she's a bitch because <laughs> this uh, reminds me, which is she did my radio show like in 2007 mm-hmm. or something, right? And she was late and she was like, she was phoning in. And she was snarky and like shitty and bitchy, and I hung up on her. Because <laughs> you did not. I absolutely did. Oh, okay. There's audio of it somewhere. There's audio of it. I don't know. I also could probably find it. She was just being sing songy and shitty, and I, you know, it's it's morning show. First off, you're always in a bad mood because you got up at five in the morning. You're a comedian, yeah. you know. And then second was is she called in like a half hour late, and and what it ends up happening is like you go. Oh, well, Ann Coulter's supposed to call in at 7.30, and then the American uh, West Coast chopper guys are going to come in at, <laughs> at, at 8, you know, and then you go, oh, now Ann Coulter didn't call in, so you got to tell the West Coast chopper, Orange County chopper guys, or whoever those guys are, that they got to bump back. It fucks everything up, yeah. right? I was not in a good mood, you know, by the time she got on the phone. I we can hear it, and then I will... But I will tell you why Ann Coulter is still Ann Coulter in a, in a second, <laughs> okay. but we'll, we'll play it. I don't even know how long it is. Lisa Lampanelli in the studio. Great to see you. Thank you, baby. Ann Coulter, who was supposed to be on the show about an hour and a half ago, is now on the phone as well. Ann? Hello. Hi, Ann. You're late, baby doll. Uh, somebody gave me the wrong number. Mm. How did you get the right number? Just dialed randomly eventually? <laughs> got to the show? <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Well, my publicist emailed it to me, I guess, after checking with you. Uh -huh. But I, I am see. really tight on time right now because I already had it. All right, we'll get lost. <laughs> Oh well, she was being yeah. sing-song and shitty with me, so I hung up on her. <laughs> yeah. And it was an hour and a half. Listen, I call into a million radio shows a month. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you get the wrong number. Yeah. And then you call your person and you fix it, and it takes about three minutes normally. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, we gave you the guy's cell number. You should have given the studio number sure. or whatever. Whatever it is. But anyway, I hung up on her. <laughs> now, that was, um, you know, 15-plus years ago. Get coming on to 20 years here. Um, but <laughs> Ami Horwitz, who is our friend, does those crazy videos. L crazy guy, but a nice guy. I talked to Ami. And uh, Ami is great friends with Ann Coulter. <laughs> okay. And so I said, uh, he, he like would say, like, I'm going out to lunch with Ann Coulter today. Mm -hmm. you know. And I'd go, oh, I'd like to talk to Ann Coulter. Because I think she's smart. Mm -hmm. and she's no. she's good at what she does, yes. and she's she's sharp, you know. Mm -hmm. And I get it; she's bitchy, but what do I care? But she's consistent. She's and you consistent. always know, like she always <laughs> she always she's had one opinion. She hasn't wavered from it. She never changes his sto her story. So I respect right. for that. So I said, uh, Ami, when you see Anne, <laughs> tell her uh, I'd like to have her on the podcast and interview her. Uh -huh. She's got a book coming out or something like mm -hmm. that. And he goes, Oh, okay. And then I talked to him a few days later, and I was like, did you tell Ann Coulter? And she said, yep. What'd she say? She said to fuck right off. <laughs> she's still pissed. <laughs> I'm like, she's, she's still pissed? It's like, she's still pissed. Well, hell hath no fury. Yeah, right. like that a, a woman, woman hung up on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That tracks. Yeah. So tracks. she'll not be coming on. People well, should know. That's okay. I think but you're... in that situation, you want jokes, and then you want bomb backup jokes too in case something doesn't land i want room joke i want like little jokes for like oh on this person's outfit you know what i mean like you know i i want i want all kinds of situational jokes and then i want rejoinder jokes for anything that could have possibly happened in the wings like someone trips coming up on stage this this is happening that's happening and then like and then he just wasn't even on the rest of the show so I don't oh. know if that was on purpose or if that was just like you, you got the gig 10 days ago. We had to fill in all this other stuff, you know. Do you know, know did they pass on some people that you were aware of or well, did some people pass on? Yeah, on they, I mean, all the articles that have were written about it said that it was like Chris Rock, Ali Wong. Um, there was a, a you know, uh, a, a some other non-white. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Obviously, Ricky Gervais, like, you know, yeah. they still offer it to him every year and he says no. So, yeah, uh, we have the clip. I think we have the oh, uh, this is the Taylor Swift. Yeah, joke. the Taylor Swift uh -huh. joke. I don't know if he did any Ann Coulter material or not. <laughs> I was doing shows last night. That's, but he bailed on the end of it. Yeah. Like if he delivers that straight to the screen. Yeah, because it got a joke. It got laughs. They just cut to the person who wasn't laughing, which was her. And it became now, a meme. What is etiquette? See, I kind of believe that's on her too. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta know you're gonna be cut to, and you gotta smile. That yeah, I, I think you gotta play along. Like uh, the ro we've all done. When you do a roast, you sit up there in the dais, and half the jokes about the. I felt personally when I do those roasts. I feel like I get roasted half the time more than the subject of the roast. Yeah, of course. And I'm like sitting up <laughs> there at the a days. certain point. I'm like, at a certain point, you got to fucking roast Trump, not me. He's <laughs> yeah. the subject of the, the roast. He's sucking Jimmy's cock, horse, mm -hmm. horse tooth bastard, you know, and he's calling me everything <laughs> like that. And you got to smile. You no. gotta laugh. You gotta Are you laugh really it up. Telling a woman that you, she has you, to smile. You have to smile, sweetie. <laughs> you have to be no. barefoot. You need to be pregnant. <laughs> you need to be in the kitchen, and you need to be smiling. No, I think you got to know the camera's going to be on you. Oh, she knew that the camera. Th that's coming what at her. I'm. That's that what I'm. That is a commentary about other jokes. That's what, what she I'm did saying. was a commentary about jokes before. I think that her her oh. response was a commentary about probably the Barbie big boobies joke. Oh, interesting. Mm. Which was a really lazy joke. Whoa. Oh, I met. So I was performing um, during the. <laughs> during I did a couple of shows, so yeah. I was kind of like out of town. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't watch no, the whole thing. No, he just compared Oppenheimer and Barbie and saying, like, oh, Oppenheimer is based on this, like, you know, 
incredible novel with this and this and this and Barbies um, about a woman with big a plastic doll with big boobies. Ah, I see. And, so, like, and it's so much more than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it really is. <laughs> so, so the ta- movie. That's Taylor, why they're so mad. So you think Taylor took took umbrage with that? Yeah, I think most of the people in the room took umbrage with it because uh, a it single handedly helped bring back people to the movie theaters all summer. So everyone is almost indebted and Oppenheimer isn't as successful if there wasn't Barbieheimer. Mm. Barbenheimer made Oppenheimer even more successful of a movie than it was. Now obviously Christopher Nolan is like an incredible director and like that movie is incredible, but is that movie as financially successful if it doesn't come out at the same weekend that Barbie does and that people made it a meme and it became a whole thing? Yeah, it's interesting because normally they go, well, you don't want your movie coming out when this blockbuster's right. coming out because everyone's going to go see that movie, but then everyone decides to see both movies. Yeah. All right. So you think that the table was set with her mm-hmm. angry puss because he told the joke. She didn't like the jokes going going into the joke oh, yeah, about going her. into it. Yeah. yeah. Going oh, into okay. it. So I think her and a lot of the people in the room were already upset mm-hmm. and- you're not going to get her to smile sweetly to the camera when she doesn't. And so approve. what's your, what's now, uh, we may have differing opinions on this. So when I do a roast and, you know, Jeff Ross is making fun of me, I I know I'm on camera, yeah. so I smile. Yeah. I laugh it up. You or, or whatever. Well, yeah, I think when people make jokes about you, I think you... Like, I always tell people, if you love the joke, laugh. If you hate the joke, laugh harder. Because it makes you look like you can take a joke. Right. And, uh, you know. So is Taylor Swift under an obligation to fake a smile in that situation? Uh, and was it that she was going for the flute of champagne just exactly at that time? Or Well, no, she, that, was, that was a purposeful move. And then in her other hand, she had another drink. So she was obviously doing something. But... Yeah, I just I just don't like that kind of power to where a look will just destroy you online. Like that's all anybody talked about after that. They they used it in memes. They used really? it. Really? Yeah, it was just just one look. Well, it was. I think she is very aware of the power that she has, but I think she's also very smart, and she knows that if she just sits there and laughs at that, it is an almost approving of everything else right. that was said before that. And oh, so I you think would condone the Barbie have, joke. Yeah, you can't. You, you're and you're also not there, on his side. You're also there almost in defense of Barbie. Like she, her award was for her movie that she was up for was against Barbie. You know, it was about the, you know, the most, what was it, cinematic achievement, which is like whoever made the most money at the mm-hmm. box office, really, which Barbie won. But she was coming there to support the Barbie film. Oh, really? So she's not just like... Oh, we, she wasn't nominated for her film? She was nominated for hers, but, but we she knew was gonna win. said that uh-huh. she's like there you know, to a big Barbie. fan. And oh. That, you know, to be oh, we support. have the Barbie joke we found now, so we can <laughs> do it. I, I, once again, and I will tell you... Uh, Always funny to make fun of Mike August, who was, but ba- ba- he, you know, he goes to the gig and then he sits back in the green room and watches football and eats. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then I, I'm up on stage for uh-huh. two shows, you know, and then at some point I came back into the green room, maybe in between shows, I guess. And uh, Mike's like, oh man, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Just called Joe Coy a misogynist pig, and she's he's tweeting. Pissed. She's it, tweeting. Yeah. She's <laughs> tweeting that he's an asshole, and I'm like, Taylor Swift is tweeting yeah. he's an asshole. Yeah, she's I go, not. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't really. So, well, yeah. I go, okay, let me see these these tweets, Mike, and then I think Chris went on. Yeah, I go online. I'm like. I don't see anybody, I don't see any tweets from her talking about the Golden Globes <laughs> at all. And then, and then Mike does what he's best at. That's what I mean, Mike. He goes, well, somebody's saying it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wow. like, you can't will yourself back to being right <laughs> by a, saying like, well, I don't know about that. It was beautiful. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what a great it, was beautiful. it was vintage, yeah. Mike, though. Vintage. Oh, wow. All right. Here's the Barbie booby mm-hmm. joke, yeah. I guess. About your eyes, right? After the audience's yeah. response. Oh, uh, well, and also he said on, Barbie was on, a, mm-hmm. but he should have said based on, maybe. Mm-hmm. I think that probably would have mm-hmm. given a little yeah. stop there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's not a ki- the kind of guy that delivers these kinds of jokes normally. Like, he's a conversational comedian. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I, he's I, not I, a set-up punch and guy. And he's, uh, he's also really nice, mm-hmm. which I just... 
I, when I heard about this initially, I love Joe, by the way. Mm -hmm. I was just like, he's super nice. And I just don't think this is his, like, like, I always saw, talk about comedy in terms of like saying like someone's funny and then it's like saying someone's athletic, mm -hmm. but you got to pick a sport, mm -hmm. you know, and, and tennis players are great at tennis, but they wouldn't be very good at football and comedy's kind of a, but, but if you're athletic, you will be better at all sports, but at a certain point you kind of have to pick a sport. And I guess my, my feeling was, is this isn't his sport. Right. He's a funny guy. He's like saying he's athletic, but this <laughs> yeah. isn't, you still, this, this is a sport. It's a really specific sport mm -hmm. and you just have to ha log like tons of hours in this sport. Yes. And that's kind of, and he's super nice. And I thought, uh, yeah. I don't know, he's not going to be the one that roast people that way. Right. I mean, I think that like, you know, Gaffigan w was a great example and Gaffigan's incredibly nice, but he got up there and, and mm -hmm. killed with his one little thing. Did you see his? Oh, I didn't see his. Was his? Wait, what was so his? So he was presenting the award for best comedy special. Oh, more clips to find. <laughs> uh, yeah, show. again, I didn't see. I was. I did it's two okay. shows in San Diego, no. so I was nowhere no, no, no. near. I, was, I mean, we had it on silent. I was watching clips online because we were watching the NFL game, the Bills Dolphins game. <laughs> That's so what I love about you. We have you. two TVs That's in the living room. That's what Mike was doing too. One for us to watch, and one usually for my son to watch, so that we don't have to pay attention to him good. while we watch yes. sports. Yes. Yes. As a good parent does. Yeah. So anyway, we definitely had the Globes on that TV. And then anytime it was something that I wanted to watch, I would turn up that TV to listen or I would watch the clips online. So mm -hmm. I was going back and forth. But I, I, do not have a show. I did not have a show like you did. Last oh, here's Gaffigan. See? Oh, yeah. Gaffigan's a real good stand-up. Very yeah. good. Yeah. And, and, and he, you're right in that he deals in jokes mm -hmm. and Joe is more conversational storyteller. Right. So you're also, once again, athletic, but what's your sport? Right. You know, the the joke tellers are going to have an advantage over right. the conversationalist. Definitely. All right, we'll mm -hmm. listen to it. Globe. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That was just, it. That was it's it, the, the one joke. That was, no, there was another one after that that I loved, too. But I, like, I think the pedophile, like, that was just really quick. That was, like, yeah. a 15-second setup and then a two-second punch. Like, super yeah. easy. But then I think he also said, like, you guys have always invited the most, like he's talking about there being a stand-up comedy category for once. And he's mm -hmm. like, this show has always notoriously invited all the beautiful people. And then you guys have now finally invited the talented ones. Oh, wow. Um, and, comics. And, and then they love that. Like they, yeah. that's a joke that is at their expense, but he had endeared himself with his own self-deprecating joke, yeah. sort of, and you know, even though he's calling them pedophiles. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, yeah. then, and Ricky won that category too. Yeah, and then Ricky Santa won. Category. <laughs> uh, well, Sarah, this is great timing you being here because I, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, she's going to have some thoughts about this. We should thoughts. we should get into this. All right, so we're done. So you can leave Thank now. God. You um, hung up on me. I have <laughs> and Coulter <laughs> still pissed. <laughs> I think I listen. I bet people bring it up to her. Oh my, maybe maybe it comes up, but. I'd like to think of myself as generally more magnanimous than Ann Coulter because <laughs> I am saying, listen, I had a beef with her too. She was, she was an hour and a half late. She was sing songy and bitchy to me on the phone. And then she's an hour and a half late and then goes, I don't have much time. So let's, let's do this, you know? And I don't know. I don't think you go an hour and a half late and then you tell the person we got to wrap this up. Yeah. You're doing them a favor. They're promoting. Right. So I thought she was really rude to you. Yeah. I have every reason to be angry at Ann Coulter. But yet, I extended an olive branch. Yeah, you turned And the I said, you know what? We had a rough patch, mm -hmm. you know, but we're all adults, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. And things didn't go our way. Mm -hmm. We had a bad first date. Mm -hmm. But I still find you attractive. Oh. <laughs> and I think you have something to say. <laughs> so how about lunch? <laughs> do you see what I did there? I do. And I said, she's smart, she's interesting. I'd like to come in... Give me in here. Let's dice it up a little bit. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, but I think all of us would love to hear that interview. But uh, 18 years in, <laughs> still pissed. Wow. Yeah. I think it's an honor that uh, someone still remembers you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Anytime a woman has never forgotten you, you can just frame it like that. Like this woman and oh. I got in a fight 18 years ago, and she still thinks about me every day. 
I my experience <laughs> with women is is they remember every bad thing I've ever done. I don't get the good stuff, but the bad stuff sticks, you know, <laughs> that endures. That's a legacy of me being a douche, you know, the good stuff, the gestures, the financially uh, open and uh, providing and things of that nature, neither here nor there, but anything bad I've done, mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed my experience with women is they're instant rain man like recall of any fucking thing I've ever said or done that was negative. Little fuzzy on the good stuff. Yeah. Little hazy. Little the good hazy. That's not as fun. We notice yeah. things. We never forget things. Mm -hmm. This is why I always say we're the best referees. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see it. You'll see it. <laughs> I'm gonna notice every little thing you did wrong. <laughs> Only women should be referees. Yeah, but I also believe women do a lot of sort of grafting and uh, upon people. Like they'll go like, I don't trust that running back. Look at him. I don't yeah. trust that guy. I'll just penalize and next you for you your know, energy. It's a legal procedure. Why? Because I don't like that guy. Yeah, there's, there's oh, and also, it's like, God forbid the guy punched out his girlfriend in an elevator Ooh. two years ago oh, or Ray something. Rice? And you're, yeah, and you're the female. Come on, the laundry's flying. <laughs> Laundry on the field. Oh, I see. I'm saying most women, any woman I know who knows that this guy balled up his fist and punched his girlfriend in the face in an elevator, mm -hmm. that guy's not getting a fair shake on Sunday. No, no. We there hold a go. grudge. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely not. That's It'll my be five argument yards against this time. It'll be 10 next time. Yeah. <laughs> That's your penalty. Mm-hmm. Hell hath no fury. But you would, I think you'd be better at when the eligible guy who's playing tackle was reporting. Yeah, because you I feel like... would remember that. Yes, I would definitely remember <laughs> that you told me that you were going to report be eligible. and be the eligible receiver. Now, yes, Dan Campbell would never be mad at me. No, Dan Campbell. <laughs> no. He's the last guy in the world you want to anger at you. No, yeah. He's the most intense, yeah. biggest, scariest guy on the planet. You just don't want... He's one of these guys that, like, when he talks, it's Chin locks up mm -hmm. and spittle comes flying yeah, out. Pure fury, yeah, yeah, angry. Yeah. I think, and, yeah. Guys and then they're just so defeated in that press conference right after. I know. I know. Oh wait, we got a, We got the extended clip of Jim Gaffigan, oh. who I really enjoy. So Taylor's well. laughing. Taylor's eating it up. Yeah, maybe I mean, overcompensating <laughs> for looking down her nose at Joe Coy. Hard, but all right, mm -mm. all right. Well, good, insightful. Glad you're here. Um, now, and let, and you have any other thoughts about uh, the Globes, uh, no. recollections, takes, well, Joe's already critiques. doing interviews about it. He, he commented about it. Yeah, reflecting on the negative interviews. He says, uh, yeah, the criticism. Negative reviews. The, yeah, Sorry. negative reviews, excuse me. Yeah, um, he says the criticism stings. Mm -hmm. He understands the backlash. He did mean to say cutaways in the uh, Taylor Swift joke, but he also says, look, I was... I don't understand why she was so mad. I was making fun of the NFL, not her. But as Sarah pointed out, maybe it could have been a uh, the Barbie joke. Yeah, it could have been something else. And then um, he said he said he had a fun night, but it was a quote a tough room. It's a hard job and a hard hard gig, which mm -hmm. we can all agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. True. Now it's uh, the 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 deck is stacked, and you should get out there. And you brought it up, and or you sort of alluded to it, but. You know, Jim Gaffigan got up there and started with the aw shucks, self-deprecating, mm -hmm. sort of got the room mm -hmm. to, you know, do that. And then, and then attack, attack that. Then yeah, you attack. once they trust yeah. you that you're going to be funny, <laughs> mm -hmm. then, yeah, I think it's like it's similar in stand-up when you first start. Like, you, you have to say the obvious. Like, I know I wasn't the obvious cho choice. I wasn't the first choice. I was the tenth choice. And then you talk about all the people who said no, and then that's a joke. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I did... Wow, this is bring you're, you're bringing back some real rush of memories. <laughs> you're bringing back good or bad. Uh, <laughs> I will I'll label them interesting. Mm -hmm. When I did, I hosted. Shit, there's more computer search in here. I would say in the year two thousand, I along with Kathy Griffin hosted like. The People's Internet Award or something, or the the People's Choice Awards, right? People's or, Choice or, Awards. Was, was it? Do we do People's, people's Choice? People's Internet Awards would be uh, hilarious. 2000, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at your browser. Uh, uh, 
Kathy and I hosted this thing in 2000. Could have been 99. I think it was 2000. Big, I see the 99 Billboard Music Awards. The 99 Billboard <laughs> Music close. Awards. So far, that's not even close. People's that's completely Internet different. Awards. <laughs> Same thing. That's... Listen, if I were a woman, I would know. <laughs> yes, you would have remembered. But I don't focus on myself that okay. closely. So I hosted the show and uh, with Kathy. And I, I'm now thinking, and Blink-182 opened the show. Yeah, you and did. And that's, that's oh us. Gosh. And I remember, I don't remember having writers or anything. I never used writers for the first, almost all of my career. And then when I got a little older, like just 10 minutes ago, I was like, oh, it's good to have writers, people giving you jokes and stuff. I just never, I never did it. And I always thought it was like sort of, Against, uh, no, you can't, if, if you're going to say something, it's got to be something you said. It can't be something someone else told you to say or something. I was always really weird about it. Later on, I was like, go get some writers and get some jokes, you know. So I wrote my monologue, as I recall. Maybe Kathy and I worked a little together. And the entire, my entire angle was who they wanted to host this show before me. Mm -hmm. And I literally went over exactly what you just described, mm -hmm. a long list of people, you know, they, they, they went out to Joey Buttafuoco, he <laughs> yes, passed, you yes. know, it was like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and that's my only memory. I don't even remember any of the other jokes. Yeah. But that was my monologue was who they went to before they came to me. Great yeah. angle. I mean, it's a great angle. I mean, and the reason... Uh I mean, I would have, like, again, listed all kinds of people. I would la list people dead, people alive. <laughs> I would list Kevin Hart and be like, you know how hard a gig has to be for Kevin to say no? Right. Like, he says yes to everything. You know what I mean? Like, you make all of those jokes. Now you got him on your side. Then you can kind of go anywhere. Then you call him pedophile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I have no idea where if... I, I don't even want to watch a tape or anything, but there's got to be a transcript or something. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> I heard, I don't know if this is true, but for your late night show, Adam, that uh, when you, you you actually weren't even there, but somebody walked into the room who knew you to this writer's room of people who didn't know you yet. This is like day one. And they said, hey, just a heads up, Adam will probably not take any of your jokes because I don't think you were used to having other people write for you yet or you yes. you like to come up with it yourself. I also, I just, I, I'm, it, it was stupid which is, I thought it was cheating sure. or yeah. disingenuous yeah. or something. And I never, I I just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And and it was, I don't know, low self-esteem or a bad upbringing or, or mm -hmm. something. I just didn't think you could, you, you should do it. I don't know why. I think a lot of comics feel that way. I mean, I, I think most comedians don't have writers for their own act. Some people do. Obviously, the bigger you get, the more help you need. Or you have people that tour with you and they just like help you with a bit that you're working on and they help you refine it, punch it up throughout, whatever. But I think when it comes to TV, and then I, I think when you when you start doing award shows, late night shows, hosting opportunities, roasts, that's when you go, all right, this is a little, I, I'm athletic, but this is not the sport that I play. Yeah. And, and I can use a good coach for this. And then road, writers are just there for your guide. You know what? Like, and you never know. Like, every time you see a joke, it might not be the joke that you actually tell, but it spawns something in your brain to go, oh, that's a good angle. Let's keep working on that angle and then put it in your voice. Because, like, you know, for the roast, like, we'll write all these jokes and put them in the bank. But until we start crafting a script in your voice, that's when we really start wiggling and finagling and changing things around and making it really sound like you together as a team. Well, as long as we're deconstructing comedy, <laughs> uh, any thoughts about Chappelle? And I, I have thoughts, which is, and I've always kind of felt this way, and I've been saying it for years, like, Everyone's like, what's up with all the woke people and everything? And I was like, everyone has to stop apologizing. Yeah. And if you, if we all stopped, they'd stop and we could get the fuck on with our lives because they need the apology. And as a matter of fact, if you establish yourself as a person that doesn't apologize, they will leave you alone. Yes. They don't. It's when you act remorseful. Yes. That, that they <laughs> that they lean in more. Well, they they're all kind harder. of stray cats, and you're a saucer of milk, and they know yeah. if you don't put it out on the back porch, mm -hmm. the cats just stop coming around. I like, think that's... people aren't truly offended. I think oh, they're no. worried. They're not offended at all. You're right. I they don't think care. they're worried someone's going to think that they're not. 
And so you have to put it out there like, I'm mad. Right. And so that it looks like it, because if you somehow, if you don't say anything, somehow you're complicit in their crime. Like no one even knows it's who you are, It's a narcissism too, yes, it's, obviously. It's we don't need your hot take, Joan Nobody yes. on Dave Chappelle. Exactly. But he doubled down on the trans stuff, <laughs> yes. which I enjoy. And everyone, you know, tough shit. They're not they're not walking out of their Netflix jobs and protesting on the sidewalk anymore because they were taught last time he did it that he that he doesn't care, Mm-mm. and we need more of that. and And then people immediately just sort of shut up and get on with it. Now, I mean, of course, Rolling Stone is going to write a shit inter, you know shit review of the stand up act, but Rolling Stone has to. And I would also so argue that. These brands are hurting themselves. I, I think Rolling Stone, I had a subscription to Rolling Stone when I was like, I don't know, 28 or something. My aunt or some distant somebody, family, female, somebody just got me subscription to Rolling Stone. And I was like, great. I, <laughs> yeah. I, and I read Rolling Stone. And now I don't listen to anything they say. Because I feel like they're so fuck. I know what they're going to say before they say it. Now, I know where they're going to come down on stuff. And I think they kind of woke themselves into a into a corner. And I no longer would go to them and go, oh, what's your take on the Dave Chappelle special? I should read your review to see if I want. Of course, you don't like it. I know what their take is on the next Dave Chappelle I know special. What yeah. ta- I, before he does it. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I don't know why they hurt their brand that way, but they just did. I mean, I still I still read some of their articles. I mean, because, um, I, you know, I just read Apple News in the morning. So, uh, you know, I just I don't I guess I don't really know specific Except for like the athletic, I know I'm going to go there and I'm probably going to enjoy the article. But even articles on the athletic, sometimes I'm like, oh my god, are you guys just jerking off the Dodgers again? You know, what I mean? like I just get so annoyed. But I, but I think that um, uh, I mean I I don't think that I really go to the press for opinions on comedy ever mm. because I feel like I unless I've watched the comedy special myself, I shouldn't be reading any opinions on it because I don't want to be swayed. I want to have my own opinion and then I can read an article on it. And I think, I think what happens is people don't even watch it. They, they have opinions on a special based on articles that they've read from different out outlets. And then all of a sudden they're worked up and they're mad. And, and, and I think Chappelle said that last time after everyone got upset, he's like, after you've watched it, we can have a conversation about, I think he said that to Hannah Waddingham, whatever her, like the, the Hannah who had a special on Netflix. Somebody. So I I think that that's only fair. I think it's only fair if we're going to be critical of any kind of art or entertainment. And obviously art is subjective. So not everyone's going to like it. And also you can still buy a Chappelle ticket and a ticket to see someone else. Like it's not a rule that you can only like one comedian. Mm -hmm. I think that people get into this frenzy of like, oh, these are the best comics. It's like, no, the best comic is whoever you just saw and that you liked. That's who's the best today. Like there's there's no ranking, there's no hierarchy. Although I would venture to say that Cat Williams is probably up there and he always gets left out, off. And I Oh thought he does, his, you're right. I feel like his his Shannon Sharp interview oh, was man. like the most insane thing I've ever heard. Unhinged. And it's better than el- any self help <laughs> book I've ever read. Does he get left off because he like fights teenagers in parking lots and acts <laughs> fucking batshit crazy? Oh no, I think he gets left off because uh, he is a disruptor. Mm. And I think he doesn't play the game. Kind of the way that, I mean, that's why I was kind of surprised that Ricky Gervais like even won that award last night because he's never willing to really play ball with all of the, you know, with with the quote unquote establishment. And I think I think Kat comes in and he goes, he's not funny. You know, he'll be like, Cedric, the entertainer is not funny. I don't know why anybody, you know, and like and you're like, whoa, like nobody talks like this. Right. You know, it's like the it's like the old guy in Love Actually when he's like, I can feel like I can ask you anything. <laughs> Greatest shag you ever had. Britney Spears. No, just kidding. She was rubbish. <laughs> like I, all I know with Kat is I played a theater mm-hmm. in Seattle I think it was Seattle. The People's Internet Awards together. I hosted the People's <laughs> Computer Stuff Award. And uh, was, uh, I, I, came, I came in and did an, an event with uh, Dennis Prager. I think he and I were mm-hmm. 
doing some speaking engagements. It wasn't a stand-up gig, like a speaking tour at some theaters around the, the country. And uh, we came in right after Cat Williams was there. He was like there the day before. Uh-huh. And I think it was that one where he bonked the guy on the head with the microphone. Mm. And and the poor... Bu- so you have to picture this. <laughs> the poor beleaguered like stage manager, the guy ran the theater, like showed up and... Dennis Prager, stately, elderly, Jewish, biblical scholar, and Adam Carolla, we turned the corner, and he's like, oh, God, thank God you guys are here. And I was like, oh, what's happening? Cat Williams was here last night. He had 13 people open for him, then went out with a mic and smacked it over the head of somebody, and then went up to this room we're in, the green room on the second floor, and started throwing cash out the window. <laughs> and a giant mob yeah. came. Like, I don't know, it's like, he, uh, we had to pay him all cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, he travels with uh, uh, Dr. Dre or something. Like, I, well, who's he? He was traveling with um, Suge Knight or something. Mm-hmm. He got paid in cash. He... 13 of his nephews opened the show and then he whacked somebody with a microphone and he left the stage and then he came back up and took the cash and started throwing it out the window in a giant mob. And I was like, well, Prager's probably not, you know, Prager <laughs> would ask for a toasted bagel or something and that that's on his rider and that's right. about as far as we're going with this. But it was the night after he and there's footage there, of him. Yeah, it's 2012. This happened at the Paramount Theater in Seattle, and you just see yeah, him got outside of the head. He was he was a pioneer, before, way before Cardi B, <laughs> way before yeah. 50 Cent. He was El Cabongan with the mic mm-hmm. long before any of these Johnny Come yeah. Lately showed up. And he, I don't know how I don't know if he's five minutes into a set or something. The guy was like he there's had like 13 around. people open. I don't even know. Yeah, did the, he really? The audience was pissed off because. They were waiting to see him. They were waiting to see him, and he was late, and Mm -hmm. then he, well, I don't know, maybe we can find this uh, footage of him whacking somebody (laughs) on the head with the microphone, but but a pioneer and a trendsetter. I think he's just really smart, and I think that I always enjoy his point of view on things, and Mm -hmm. even when it comes to canceling, like, he's always just like, I, 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 you know, he says that there's never been anyone that's canceled that he misses. (laughs) You know, and like, or he'll say like, comedy isn't fun unless there's an out of bounds. And so, you know. You think he likes Ann Coulter? (laughs) He would only be able to say that if he had met her. He doesn't have any opinions on people that he's If you showed him a picture of Ann Coulter, (laughs) would he be able to say her name? Oh, I don't know. No. No, I'm going no. I doubt it. No. I would be disappointed if he did. But I don't know. I mean, he's a really smart guy. I mean, I didn't know that he could read at the age of three. You know what I mean? Like, he's like a really, really smart, smart guy. And fast. Very fast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Very strong. Stronger than he looks. Well, he did get beat up by a 13-year-old, I think, at another. Do you guys remember this one? What is his life? What's going on with Cat <laughs> oh, Williams yeah, in like your a recollection? Court he, or something? he did like MMA square off with like some 13 year old kid in the front of an apartment building, too. <laughs> and the kid like got the best of him. Well, he's a small guy. <laughs> he's a small guy. Was yeah. it one of the kids he adopted? Because he has a bunch of adopted kids. He could have been fighting his own kids. Yeah. Uh, all right. Do we have him whacking anyone on the <laughs> head? Is that on the internet? That, I feel like it's a clip somewhere, right? Oh. Uh-oh. Oh. Oh, that was hard. I'm... Yeah. What the heck was that? I'm telling you, that was a big shot he came. Oh, stop clapping right now! Don't be nosy, don't be nosy, it can happen to you. Record me after I say don't and see what happens to you. Let me see your light recorded me and see what happens. Don't worry, if you don't like it, I'll be here all night. Go home and get your raggedy pistol and bring it back. I wish I had his uh, chutzpah. He should do the Golden Globes. He should do the fucking. I would watch the shit out of that. (laughs) Oh my god! All right, let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll do some news, and we'll do that right after this. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. So it's a new year, and uh, everyone focuses 
on how to change instead of expanding what we're already doing right. So everyone's trying to quit something. How about you do more of what's uh, working as well? Better help. Therapy can help you find your strength and make changes that really stick. Uh, always been a fan of therapy. Dr. Drew's always been a fan. It's really important. And when you get it right, then everything in your life is affected in a positive way. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient. It's flexible. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So let's get going this year with BetterHelp. Right, Dawson? Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. Thrive Market for money, health, and convenience. Be smart about eating. Thrive Market, all your groceries and household essentials online. Thrive Market carries brands with the highest quality ingredients and sourcing methods. They restrict hundreds of ingredients across their food and cleaning categories, so you know it's always the best, highest quality stuff. Whether you want organic, low sugar, gluten-free, or more, curate your own shopping experience with just a few clicks. Save money on every single grocery order, 30% on average. That's right, you do save money at Thrive Market. When you join Thrive Market, you also help a family in need with their one-on-one -on -one membership matching program. You join, they give. So do something healthy for yourself this year and join Thrive Market. Am I right, Dawson? Join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash Adam for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Adam. Thrivemarket.com slash Adam. Tiana is on the Adam Carolla Show. 44 is the name of the special on YouTube as we speak. Sarah's going to hang out. We'll do some news. Sure. All right. Well, I'm glad Sarah's here because I got some sports stories. Let's start off with uh, a linebacker out of Indiana who went viral just because of his name. Mm. So uh, we'll put up the picture of his name. So he's drawn plenty of attention this week because he, he tweeted that he was going to go visit uh, West Virginia University. He's visiting colleges. And he had millions and millions of impressions just based off of his name, which is uh, Noah. His first name's Noah. And his last name, I will just spell it, K-N-I-G-G-A. Uh -huh. so, how is it pronounced? <laughs> so I, I do know how it's pronounced. It's, how is it pronounced? It's Kaniga. Kaniga. Yeah. All right. Noah's such a, he needs a better, you know, he should be a, like a DeAndre Kaniga. I think that would be better. He should He's a white Noah. guy, but the Noah's too white, you know. The Noah cancels out the second name. He's he got the whitest first name. Very, yeah, that's like a, that's a... So, yeah, he's totally leaning into this, by the way, on, on Twitter. Like, mm -hmm. all the people sharing it. He's loving it. Pat McAfee talked about it on his show. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, he's sharing that clip, thanking him. And, yeah, he's he's totally leaning into the internet clout and just uh But he has, they it. have to say knaysayers. Is that how they have <laughs> yeah, to say it? They say it yeah, they <laughs> say Yeah. So if he does make it to the show... And he gets out on the field. He's going to fuck up every broadcaster <laughs> yeah, yeah. on the planet. Think about this. I thought about this when Jared Goff first got drafted. I would tell any of my friends, just say Jared Goff really fast 10 times. Eventually, you're going to be saying jerk off. Yeah. And they still say Jared Goff. And I was really concerned that they were just going to cut that in half. They're going to call him Jared or they're going to call him Golf Goff because <laughs> it sounds like jerk off. They still do it. So this... You know, there may be a place. There There's precedent. Be, there may be room for this. I mean, it's just West Virginia is a really tough place for you to be going and having that. Name. I used to. Um, <laughs> There's a guy that used to do politically incorrect. I felt like a lot. It's like a pundit kind of mm -hmm. political guy, black guy, and I used to do it a p politically incorrect a lot too. And his name was. Niger Ennis. And that's another one you could fuck up <laughs> yeah. with like one beer. You're yes. one beer away from cancellation. When it, and I was always scared of like, sitting across the panel. Because I agree with the, I mean, Ni Niger. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough one. You just don't. And I think Niger was 
he was he was just a G away. Yeah. Uh, he was like N I G E R N, and also anus sounds a lot like anus. I, I thought I was going to go. I was yeah. going to really south on me. You're like I just don't even want to do the show with him. I don't want to get. The, I don't want to do the show. Yeah, Niger Ennis. I don't know what he's doing now, but he was he was out there. All right. So speaking of Pat McAfee, though, so he is has been in the news because mm-hmm. he publicly accused a network exec at ESPN for trying to sabotage his show. Um, and uh, uh, ESPN apologized for the Aaron Rodgers comments about Kimmel. All right. But I, listen, I don't want to be douchey, but I feel like. I'm seeing too much Pat McAfee. I, I see him every he's time everywhere. I call, every everywhere. time I turn something on, he's just sitting there with a cowboy hat and a tank top or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I don't know when we decided that we needed a 24 seven Pat McAfee right. takes on everything. He's the Rob Deirdrich of yeah, ESPN. We, we, yes. We did not decide that we needed more <laughs> Pat McAfee. ESPN decided, oh, because he's doing well on his own YouTube channel with his own YouTube viewers. That, like somehow the rest of us need to see it. I don't know if you've realized, but my my husband keeps saying like the last few weeks, he's like, I don't know if you noticed, but McAfee's wearing a shirt now, not wearing I, cake tops. I anymore. noticed that yeah. because I have to, because <laughs> every time I turn around, yeah. he's on a computer or a TV set. I know. We're, we're getting inundated with him. Like, it's like when you see an athlete that's in too many commercials where you're like, all right, enough. Let me miss you. You know what I mean? Pat Shackafee. <laughs> it's like the ultimate and always. If, if, if Shaquille O'Neal or Pat McAfee are not on a TV, and, and they're, yeah. they're, they're, I don't think 10 seconds goes by that they're not physically on TV, one or the other. Yeah, I, I'm I'm over it. I'm sick of seeing him all the time. I do think that he's fun on game day morning. I mean, uh, not game day, on college game day. I think he's okay, but like in doses. But like the more I see him, like he did the ESPYs this last summer during the writer's strike too. Like He's because, wrestling. And he wanted to do, he wrote all of his own material, didn't want any help with anything. Oh. He went all in like, Coulter okay. on your ass. Yeah, no, I didn't get to write on it because it was the strike, but. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, he not, didn't want any help no matter good? what. I don't know. I didn't watch it. Oh, I can't tell you. I didn't oh. watch it. I thought you were going to watch with an angry eye. No, no, no. <laughs> like you women do, and then remember yeah. every joke that bombed. Yeah, no. Ah, uh, too bad your hero Jim Gaffigan <laughs> couldn't host that SB award. Oh yeah, my hero. I, I don't see. I'm a little with sports. I love sports. I, I love NFL. I love football. I've always loved football. I don't get that caught up in the guys with their hot takes and stuff like that. I, I just feel like there's the whole thing about sports, you know, for me is like watching sports and guys like pontificating about sports is kind of the opposite of watching. It's like yeah. two middle-aged guys sitting and talking and I want to see guys running into each other mm-hmm. 20 miles an hour. <laughs> and so I've always been huge into sports, but I've never huge into sports casters and commentators and stuff. I, I thought, you know, John Madden was fun with yes. his turducken and that kind of yeah, stuff. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I liked all the Howard Cosell Monday Night Football stuff mm-hmm. and Dandy Don Meredith and turn out the lights, mm-hmm. the party's over. <laughs> like I I liked all that stuff. I was a kid, you know, yeah. it, was, it was kind of fun. But now You're when... Like, I it, like hearing Frank Gifford get drunk in the booth. Yes. <laughs> I want to bite hey. you. <laughs> Um, but, but, but now it's like just 200 million podcasts and internet shows and everything like that. It's just too much talking about sports, not enough playing of sports or plenty of playing, but I just want to watch them play. I don't really need to hear. And I, so I don't know if a guy like McAfee is really funny or he has really insightful Mm -hmm. takes. Like, I don't really know what he does. I just know he's physically there all the time. Sports and news to me are very similar, where it's just like, like if they just played Sports Center on a loop all day until it was time for the game, then I know, oh, I can just tune into Sports Center and catch up on highlights whenever I want. I'm not tuning into ESPN to hear somebody's take on the game last night. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, yeah. And then, you know, I feel like this is the same with the news. It's like, I don't care about your opinion. I just want to know what I just watch the local news now because I'm like, Ooh. I don't want to hear your opinion on the world or what you think is happening. I don't care because I, none of that affects me personally. Like, I'm just going to watch what I know is like actually happening in my neighborhood. And then I'm, I'm done with it. So is McAfee good? Is he a blowhard? <laughs> 
I think he has gotten very, is very proud of who he has become. Oh. That yeah. is my opinion. Mm. And I mm-hmm. feel like, you know, I, I do, I, what I loved about him in the beginning was how self deprecating he was and like punters are people too. And then like, I'm like from this like no name position, you know, trying to make a name for these people. And then now I feel like he believes that he has, you know, all this power in sports. And that's, and now it's kind of lost the luster of what I think we initially fell in love with him about, which was getting his back humility. to the award shows. You want some self deprecating yeah. going on. I'm, I'm completely <laughs> with you on that too. And it's weird because I feel that way a lot with song lyrics. I like guys who write jokes that are sort of funny about mm-hmm. their lyrics I don't like all the, I took them and I rocked their world, I to bang them, <laughs> lock up the daughters and the wives because I'm coming to town. You know, yeah, it's like, just fucking fuck weird, weird grandiose. I hate, I hate yeah. grandiose I can do no wrong, song yeah. lyrics. I don't like all the big chick anthems either where we're so powerful and stuff like that. Like, I just, I like. Yeah, like the Who's My Wife. The whole song's about how John Entwistle's wife is going to beat the shit out of him when he gets home because he's a womanizer and, uh, uh, and a drinker. Yeah, and I mean, I, I listen to a lot of country music, and a lot of it is just like you know, you know, booting your ass kind of stuff. And I'm like, none of you guys would have ever even lasted in a fight with Johnny Cash. Do you know what I mean? Like, Merle Haggard met Johnny Cash in prison and became a singer because of Johnny Cash. Like, he went to prison, and you guys, you know, go to the Gap. Like, I, I have no, I have uh, like very little respect for a lot of that anymore yeah Just the, the the very first verse of my wife is my life's in jeopardy murdered in cold blood is what i'm gonna be i haven't been home since friday night and now my wife is coming after me mm-hmm. that's uh a karate <laughs> expert with a machine gun i think is uh, in there too like who's coming after yeah. him yeah you know it's funny uh my favorite uh <laughs> yeah. john hyatt always writes funny songs and coming full circle uh he had a song now none of his songs some of the songs were hits, usually covered by other people, but he was he's self self deprecating mm-hmm. and funny, mm-hmm. which I always like, whereas Hall and Oates aren't. Mm-hmm. So fuck them. But he <laughs> has a song called The Wreck of the Barbie Ferrari. He's talking about Barbie's dream car and how it got it got into a wreck. Because a woman was driving. Yes, Taylor yeah. Swift does not like that song. <laughs> no, I don't even. It's it's what? it's it's not on my top twenty of uh, John Hyde songs. It's just the idea that he's writing a song about Barbie's Ferrari that that shows it's more interesting than blowing into town, mm-hmm. banging your wives, rocking your world, and then you know back on the road because I'm like a cowboy with a six gun instead of a six shooter, or whatever six string. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know what the lyrics are of this song. I, it's probably... Yeah. And Freddie Powers, who wrote all Merle's hits. You can get to the chorus here. I just want to see what the Barbie... And this woman a lot, and the song's called Until His Penis Came Between Us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so he's singing about this chick he loved, and then she starts fucking somebody else. Mm-hmm. You got to find Tell His Penis. I don't know if this is even on a, a record. I ever played you this one? No, I think I'd remember that. <laughs> it's a funny song called His Penis Came Between Us. Hmm. And uh, But again, self-deprecating. Yeah. You're not the one yeah. g- rocking everybody. You're the one who's getting yeah. cheated on. I don't, yeah. More don't, more interesting. Yeah, I think that's way more well, interesting. Speaking of uh, guys whose penises go between oh. other people. Um, so Tiger Woods is in the mm-hmm. news. He is, he is uh, announced that he has just ended his longtime partnership with Nike after 27 years. Man. One of the most iconic brand relationships in pro oh, sports history. Oh, I mean, he made enough to buy a Mercedes-Benz in that time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe in a Jaguar. Barbie Ferrari, yeah. And the Barbie Ferrari. Yeah. And why did he end? Has he got his own brand? Something. Probably? He says there's something yeah. next coming up. I mean, so there's been there's been a lot of uh, like pictures come, going around, especially in the last tournament. He was Only three. John Hyatt and Ry Cooter. Oh. I mean... This song's 45 years old, right? Tape like Two terrific little cats Is there something that I might have missed You haven't heard a word I say It's a beautiful song Since his penis Came 
between Since his penis he, he delayed his own his own lyrics came between Now I don't mean to seem angry but I'm a bit taken back What did you say his name was? Oh my god, it's not Jack That scoundrel's gonna get a talking to Tomorrow at the coffee machine <laughs> It's always someone you know In this case, my best friend Aww. Would he do this to me? We just met up last weekend Got news for Mr. So and so. He won't be teeing off with me. <laughs> Since he's been... There's no more self deprecating song yeah, than this one. The guy and his work is fucking his girlfriend. Since he's been... <laughs> but he doesn't even remember his best friend's name. <laughs> Said it was Jack. <laughs> or something. <laughs> Is it bigger than a bread oh. box or shorter than your maiden name? Is the control. it as high as an elephant's eye? Is it like mounting a great white steed? I mean, this thing you have for you. This, this shall we say? <laughs> Let's turn off the lights, dear. It's time for bed. Oh, look, there's Ed and Johnny. If you'd rather watch instead, I'm glad that we could have this little talk. Good night and pleasant dreams, my love. So they stay together. That's a vivid picture, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. I have every John Hyde <laughs> album. It's not on any album. I just remember that wow, that song is memory. out there somewhere. Hmm, it's like you have a woman scorned memory. <laughs> I know. Now, funny, <laughs> self deprecating. That's yeah. what you want in a song. That's what you like. Yeah. That's what you like. And it's actually a pretty good song. It never plays it. All right. Sorry. Penis All right. news. All right. Penis news. Um, so there's this uh, this guy in North Carolina who got his car stolen mm -hmm. and he calls so he calls the cops they, they find out it was stolen around 4 a.m he doesn't know he's he's on the phone with the cops forgets to go to work because he's, he's been on the phone for so long he works at a walmart by the way mm -hmm. and his uh boss at walmart calls him he's like where are you where are you? he's like oh my car got stolen it's like what are you talking about your car is in our parking lot right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. turns out the guys who stole his car went to the walmart he worked at Mm. Went shopping, and that's how they got caught. Caught, caught mm. with a bunch of other licenses, wallets in their car. So ah. they, just the odds of stealing yeah. a car and f going to the person's. <laughs> place it's of good work. too because most of the time when you tell your boss like hey, my car doesn't start or stolen or I can't come in, they're like, yeah, okay, you're sure. going fishing. Yeah, right. Liar. But this is this is evidence. This is in North Carolina. Yeah. Oh well, I mean the odds of. <laughs> Ending up at a Walmart in North Carolina are pretty high. <laughs> yeah, you should just assume that person works at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, now I don't know if this guy's fully covered with insurance, but I used to drive around with no insurance for a long time, and I put a fuel cutoff switch in my car, and I talked about it last weekend, I think back somewhere in Phoenix, but um, I spray-painted my stereo so it wouldn't get stolen. Mm -hmm. Everyone else goes, how does that prevent your stereo from being stolen? I defaced it. You steal stereo so you can sell stereo so you can get I drugs. See. And if I ruin it with spray paint, you can't sell it. Got it. So I, I defiled it in advance. <laughs> I, I sprayed right over my little Sony digital stereo, which was the only valuable thing in the, in the truck. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I put a fuel cutoff switch uh, on it so that you couldn't get very far with it if you did s steal it, which which happened a couple of times. How does that work? What, what is a fuel cutoff switch? What does that mean? This was a 84 Nissan standard bed pickup truck with a bench seat, no air conditioning. Uh -huh. um, it had a carburetor. Uh -huh. Most cars are injected now. 
Okay. Carburetors have float bowls back then, and they would have some fuel in it. Like if you took a carbureted car mm -hmm. and you just cut the fuel off to it, it would still start because it would use the, okay. the the fuel that's in the float bowl of the carburetor, and you could probably drive about a hundred yards, and then it would start bucking, and and you would stop. Um, I just went underneath the truck, found the fuel pump in the back where the fuel tank was. And I just took one of the wires, didn't matter which one, I just clipped it. And then I added uh, a wire to it, ran a, just a standard toggle switch, like one of those little chrome just toggle switch, put it under the bench seat and ran the other wire back and reconnected it. So when I flipped that switch, fuel pump stopped. And I started flipping the switch. I started figuring out how long it ran with the switch off, mm -hmm. with the fuel off. It was like two blocks. So one block from my apartment, I've just reached down and flipped the switch. So I knew if somebody stole it, it would start, and then they would drive away, but it would run out of gas in a block. Got it. And, okay, yeah. and, and it wouldn't be like it had a kill switch in it because they started it and drove off. But if you used to put kill switches in and people look for the kill switch. Sure. It started, and they drove off, and they thought they ran out of gas. Right. And so I would just go find my car. <laughs> the two times it was stolen. I literally walked up front of my apartment. I was like, what direction was my truck facing on the street when I pulled in from work last night? Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, it was facing that way. And I just started walking that way. And I found it. Uh, the ignition was pulled out of it because oh. they stole it. Sure. So I had to start an ignition was a dealer item and way too expensive for me back then. So I would start the car with a miniature screwdriver. I just put a <laughs> slot head screwdriver in the ignition, start the car, and uh, and it worked. So I just I didn't need the ignition. I and it, I didn't need the keys. I would leave the car open because the, the the stereo was spray painted. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get my windows busted. Sure. And it worked out good until the cops saw me starting the car and driving the car with the blown out ignition, the keys. Well, what, what does it matter? What Because they it? think I'm driving a stolen truck. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Come on, sir. I'm sorry. I'm like, so, it's not illegal to drive with a screwdriver. <laughs> it is when they think you stole the truck. Yeah, that's the only issue. So these guys, these two cops pulled me over. It's by Griffith Park. Uh -huh. And they're like, all right, get out of the car. You know, like they had a, they were busting me because uh -huh. I stole a truck. And they're mine. And I was like, uh, they're like, you know, whose truck is this and bullshit and, and all that. And I was like, and what's the ignition doing? I, I go, well, someone tried to steal it. And now I started with a screwdriver because I don't need the keys because yeah. I spray painted the stereo. <laughs> He's like, they're like, what'd you spray paint the stereo for, smart guy? And I was like, so it won't get stolen. They're like, how's that going to prevent it? I go, well, you, you steal it to sell it to buy drugs. You can't sell a stereo that's been painted brown. And these two cops were like, and you got a fuel cutoff switch? Yeah, I put a fuel cutoff switch in there. Now I, I don't. I found my truck. It got stolen coming down. And these two cops are like, "Jesus, you're a genius." <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say they you're probably like, offered you a job. You're getting citizen of the year. Go on your way. Sorry, we stopped you. Here's the key to the city. They were so can impressed. We these two yeah. cops. It was great. They're like, "Here's the key to the city. You can use yeah. this instead of your screwdriver to start yeah. your car." I could start the city with a with a craftsman. <laughs> Phillips said. Yeah, so oh, I drove. I think I drove the car for the rest of the time with a screwdriver. Wow! I just kept it on the seat. Or when would you have dates in there? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, did you have to explain a lot, or you just never went on dates? Couldn't have helped. Have to? I did. I did have. A, I did go on a couple of dates. Mm -hmm. um, I remember. Well, the truck had a lumber rack and a bed box <laughs> toolbox in it too. So <laughs> the ladies kind of knew what they were getting into yeah. when I. When I pulled up, but yeah. I did, uh, I remember going out on a date with this actress named uh, Anita Barone, I think was in. She ended up making it into a sitcom playing like, you know, Jim Belushi's wife or something. You can okay. look up Anita Barone. She was beautiful, you know, we were both 27 and a half or something, and I pulled up in the pickup truck. <laughs> you know, we, she was like a struggling actress. I was struggling oh, everything. Great. What sitcom was Anita Barone in? Anyway, beautiful. I loved her. Uh, first date. <laughs> and uh, we went out to dinner in my pickup truck with the screwdriver and the kill switch or something. And when we got back to her apartment building, I like said, yeah, I got this kill switch, you know, I put under my seat, you know. <laughs> 
very prudent, you know. I look sure. at my truck stolen, you know, and I, I reached down and I flipped the switch off, but I also had a bottle of wine oh. under there, you know. <laughs> and uh, Friends. Jeff Foxworthy's show. Oh, she was Jeff Foxworthy's wife. Yeah, she's in Friends, yeah. Seinfeld. Yeah. Uh, and I reached down, I pulled out a bottle of wine, and I said, uh, maybe we should head up to your unit and uh, <laughs> get into this bottle of wine. And she's like, nah. Nah. We're good. And you go, but I got a wine opener right here. And you take the screwdriver, <laughs> screwdriver out, out and you <laughs> plug it into the bottle. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just turn my fuel cutoff switch back on <laughs> and uh, put the bottle of wine back under the bench seat. I'll be, uh, I'll be on my way. Could have been turning you on tonight. I'll be but on instead... my way, Anita. <laughs> yep. Too late. Yeah. Oh, well, it's mm-hmm. her loss. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's her loss. It's her loss. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, it's her loss. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she just she wasn't early money, you know. I was I was driving the truck with the blown out ignition and the lumber rack, and I just wasn't I wasn't doing so well back then, you know. Yeah, but you're still funny and charming, I'm sure. Mm, right. You know, I was always funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that it didn't it wasn't. Not there wasn't a lot of purchase power to, to my comedy back then. I think they wanted to see something come out the other end oh. instead of me just being funny. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Being in Hollywood, maybe that's always the, the issue. Yeah, and she was beautiful actress, and she was kind of – she's talented, too, and she was kind of on her way, and, you know, I would have just been a albatross. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been an anvil on her dinghy, you know. All right. So she moved on, but I'm sure she regrets it on a almost <laughs> yes. daily basis. She has to. Now. I'm sure. Yeah. She's probably written many books about it. Yeah. Just like Ann Coulter. Her and Ann Coulter's complaining yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Get together. Yeah, together. Yep. You're lost would be the name of that book. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove my truck back to my rent control department in Santa Monica and mm-hmm. just drank my wine alone. I mean, honestly, that sounds like a dream to me. Anytime it I does get now. Alone, now, now it sounds, yes. now yeah, it sounds right. like a dream. Now in your when 20s, you're 27 like, and yeah. horny now. Yeah, no, not as fun. And oh man, I was into her. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we only went out on one date. Was she already doing acting when you met her? Was she just starting? Or? She was a friend of my friend Chris Darga, who was a Groundlings guy who's been in a million movies and you would like know his face and was in Hudsucker Proxy and the Coen Brother films and stuff. And he worked a lot and he and his wife were friends with her and we went, they invited me to go see a play or something she was in. And I, I was smitten. I was like, oh. oh, she's really funny and she's really beautiful and stuff. And they were kind of like, oh, I think she's single. You know, maybe we could mm-hmm. arrange something here. So yeah. we got, oh, uh, yeah, there's Chris Darby. You haven't seen her since. <laughs> no, I got, I, I, I got one date, I think. Yeah? Yeah. One date. No, I think she- I got one date. I got one date, but I did not make it up to the apartment with my bottle of wine. <laughs> How long did you have the truck for, though? Um, I had the truck for probably about probably about three or four years, and uh, then I sold it and stepped up into a pretty righteous Zuzu Trooper. Ugh. You know, because a Zuzu Trooper mm-hmm. was had a, a bit of a feel of driving a normal car. Because when you drive a fucking mini truck from the eighties, yeah. it's not like you're driving a car. You know, yeah. it's a bench seat. There's no headrest. The seat's one big long seat, it's you know, it's fucking, yeah. everything's hard plastic and stuff. Yeah. I got the Zuzu Trooper because I could still put sacks of concrete and shit in the back and strap on some plywood to the roof and stuff. I could still be a carpenter, yeah. but I felt like I was driving <laughs> something more normal, sure. you know, because I said, pulling up on a date in a Japanese mini truck with a fucking lumber rack on top. I mean, it was just, wasn't happening. Those mini trucks when I was growing up, because I grew up like, between cow pastures and sheep farms and like everybody that had chicken houses and cow pastures, they all had these little mini trucks and we would get to drive them when we were 14. I mean, they were honestly safer for us to drive in the fields than a four wheeler. So yeah. we would drive them all around the fields. I thought those little trucks were awesome. Well, oh. where were you when I was 20? Oh no, wait, you were 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Did, do car, did cars uh, matter to you when you were dating? Like what car they were driving? No, I mean, I never had that luxury. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the luxury of being picky. I guess I guess I was good looking and I was funny, mm-hmm. but I was kind of a loser, you know, even yeah. though I mean I wasn't I was a carpenter. Yeah. You know, and I was like 
you know, doing groundlings classes and, and stuff like that. But I didn't have any money. I didn't, I didn't really make any yeah. any money. I was like, like a carpenter who didn't. I was like the most honest carpenter in the world, so I never made any money. I was just like, I'm going to charge you fifteen dollars an hour, <laughs> yeah. and I'll go I'll go to the Home Depot in Glendale and buy ten sheets of plywood for your job, but I'm not charging you for that. I only charge you when I get to the job site and whatever. And I was just like too honest and too. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any. I, I didn't bid shit. I didn't gouge anybody. I work for rich people. And I just go. <laughs> <laughs> 15 bucks yes. straight away. That's it. And, uh, and I won't Fair charge price. you until I get here. And I won't. I would front the money. Mm-hmm. I had this oh old rich bitch who lived in the Palisades in a house that's $13 million now. And I fronted all the fucking cash for her crown molding that I did. And I did a whole bunch of fucking work. And she turned out to be a crazy shrew. And at the end, she just was batshit crazy, and she was just rich old woman. And we like had this argument, and she's just like, "I said, okay, forget it. We won't we won't work together anymore." She was a really difficult, but she was like, "But I was like, I am out three hundred bucks for your crown molding, which I fronted for you, and I would be happy if you paid me that yeah. money back." And she's like, "Fuck you." <gasps> And I just went back to my shitty truck and drove back to my should shitty have taken apartment. Your screwdriver and put it in all her. I tires. should have put it right in. Yeah. Where yes. the sun don't exactly. shine. Should yeah. Have oh, that. Yeah. No. Yeah. I would have loved to have met people like carpenter. My dad was a carpenter. He was really good at mm. building anything. And my biggest complaint when I was dating was that men only had calluses on one hand, not two. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, what? Well, yeah. You I mean, know. Things could have been very different for us, you know, know. but I mean, our hatred of Pat McAfee <laughs> and Ann Coulter and our love of Jim Gaffigan yeah. and my carpentry skills yeah. and your love of mini pickup yeah. trucks. Yeah. That, I think there could have been mini. something. I yeah. don't even remember that I liked mini pickup Well, that's trucks. what I'm here yeah, for. I'm here, yeah. Yeah. You follow that, that muse from your childhood. Yeah. I could see. Yeah. A three yeah. on the tree or was it a... This was a four-speed... Manual um, mm-hmm. down down on the floor. Sure. The the tree Four on the floor. Three on the tree was fucking the fifties, sixties. We got by the time they got in the eighties, we got the four mm-hmm. on the floor and the three were off the tree. My dad had a truck from the eight. I thought he had a Ford from the from the eighties. That's what I learned on. Was it three was on the, the tree? Three on the tree. It was awful. It was so hard. It was impossible. I. Do you even know what three on the tree is? No. It's it's shifting. It's, the shifting column was on the steering column. The, sh- the shifter was on the steering column. You'd see in like old movies, guys like reaching up there yeah. and going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's three on the tree. I don't think Ford made anything in the 80s on the tree, but I don't you know. You still use a clutch with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah, yeah the clutch, it's a foot oh, pedal. I heard yeah. clutch, and then you clutch, clutch in, clutch oh, in, clutch yeah. in. That's all my dad would be screaming yeah. all of them. I'm like, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even reach it, you know? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I ended up just, they gave me like an automatic car. Thank God. I didn't have to learn to do Mm. any of that crap. We should talk to Anita Barone. Yeah. Let's get her on. Get her on. You know, er, er, we tried this with the man show once. We're like, we're going to get hold of all the women who dumped Adam and we're going (laughs) to talk to them. Right? Yeah. And their recollection was like, oh no, I liked him. He didn't like me. Like, it's so revisionist. It's like, listen. I was in your fucking driveway. I know where that apartment building is. I remember when I pulled out that bottle of wine and you went, what's that for? And I was like, oh, I thought we could drink some wine. She's like, ah, I don't think so. I remember that. I We did not, it was not, it's clear, it's definable. But you it's, already said that women have a better memory. So that's maybe true. Maybe you are revisionist history. Mm. Yeah, they do <laughs> have a good memory, but they're also good at constructing sure. memories that say, that, that serve creative. serve them. And for some reason, mm. when Jimmy was reaching out to all these old girlfriends of mine who dumped me, <laughs> <laughs> they were all like, "Nah, you." Uh, that didn't go. It happened the other way. Then I start thinking. Well, maybe I got a problem with like low self esteem. Like maybe every time <laughs> I think I got dumped, I dumped them. Oh, mm-hmm. I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? But, but it but, sounds like you were more of the dumpy. Than yeah, the you dumper. do have really low self esteem too. So I don't. Yeah, I do. I so think, I think it showed. Like especially like if you're like working for somebody and you're 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 not charging them for a <laughs> yeah. lot of things. Like it shows. 
Yeah, low self esteem. You're not confident. Oh, I like I I don't I, I, I know. If- I remember working for somebody once for like ten dollars an hour, right? And I was I was just going ten bucks mm-hmm. early in my carbony career, and the guy, the woman was like, "All right, so ten bucks, and you've been here eight hours, so that's." 50 bucks. <laughs> she oh, like gave me 50 uh, bucks and I just stood there and went, okay, right. okay. Uh, and I just turned around and left. Like I wouldn't even fucking say anything to her. It was so gotta weird. Gotta be like Cat Williams. Be like, Should have no. fucking taken my yeah. microphone and went, hey, yeah. bitch. <laughs> and cash. Cash. No checks. I'm going to throw this shit out the window. Yeah. And start a riot. <laughs> that poor guy at that theater was like, Dennis Prager, sitting there yeah. studying the Bible, you know. <laughs> and they took... That window right there, he started throwing tennis shoes and cash out, and people started rioting. Oh, like yeah. he was. He's a very generous man. He does like to give money away. Cat does. Cat does. Obviously, yeah, yeah, not Dennis Prager. Yeah. yeah, no, he throws it out. He demands cash and then throws it out the window. <laughs> he always says, he's like, when I come to your town, like, I'm here to spend money and, like, in the economy. Like, I'm going to go to the casino. I'm going to go to the game. I'm going to go to here. I'm going to go to that. I'm going to spread my money around. I didn't know you around. loved Cat so much or knew so much about him. <laughs> he's an enigma to me. Like, Well, I think that's why I like him is because we just rarely ever hear from him until he just gets so mad at all these things that people are saying that he just comes down off of, you know, Do you think it's genuine? Because like a lot of the people he called out in that Shannon Sharp interview have already came back and and just talked more shit on Cat, right? Like Kevin Hart said, like responded to it. Kevin Hart responded to it like three times since since then. Yeah. What do you say about Kevin Hart? Like, not funny. Oh, he and... said that he got all the scripts that Kevin Hart um, was offered. And then he also said that they, the t- Kevin's timeline of being a struggling comic doesn't match up. Mm. So when he was supposed to be in Philadelphia, you know, like coming up as a comic, but then he had already made it by that by the other so time. He's so he's lying. He's saying so. his timeline doesn't match up. Which uh, I don't, and he said I don't know. Cedric the Entertainer wasn't funny. And he, the, said, uh, he said Cedric ripped one of his jokes. Like, Cedric's oh. closing joke in Kings of Comedy was ripped off from one of Cat's jokes, well, like a BT special. Smash audience member with the microphone is kind of my thing. Too, so <laughs> turn about is fair play, Cat. That's all I got to say. All right. Uh, who's here? Who's Cheryl here? Burke. Cheryl Burke. Uh, God. Yes. Million seasons of Dancing with the Stars. Oh, my God. 30, She's good. 30... 31 seasons? Well, 26 seasons. She she missed a, she missed a few, but she went all the way. She just stopped like in 2022. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sarah, let me give you a plug. Uh, 44, name of the special. Very funny. Thank you. Uh, Film of the Comedy Store and available on YouTube. Yeah. Always Thank good you to so see you, much. my dear. Always good to see you. We'll uh, take a quick break. Be right back with Cheryl Burke right after this. Oh, oh, O'Reilly. Don't miss Do It Right deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. How long has it been since you've changed your spark plugs? Yeah, that's a good question. Replacing your spark plug can can restore efficiency and performance to your vehicle. Get better gas mileage as well. And right now at O'Reilly Auto Parts, get a $12 O'Reilly gift card after rebate when you purchase four or more select AC Delco Iridium spark plugs. Maintain your performance and fuel mileage with new spark plugs from O'Reilly Auto Parts. You can also improve visibility with their new wiper blades. Right now, save 12 bucks on a pair of Rain-X Rugged XL wiper blades, plus get two times O rewards points. An extra large profile and premium features make rugged XL blades the right choice for extreme weather and driving durability. The professional parts people will even install your new pair of wiper blades for free. From spark plugs to wiper blades and more, save now with Do It Right deals in store at O'Reilly Auto Parts or (laughs) O'ReillyAuto.com. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. No one put baby in the corner. If you said dirty dancing. Nobody puts baby in the corner. You're correct. Now, back to the show. Cheryl Burke in here from a million years of Dance with Stars and everything else. One, you won your first two 
seasons, right? Back in 1965, it feels like. <laughs> Drew Lachey and Emmett Smith. It strike. It started to dawn on me that guys who played sports were winning because they were super competitive. I guess, or is it because they're so athletic or both? I, I mean, I think they just know how to be coached, whether it's from a woman or a man, is it's irrelevant. Um, they just do the work beyond the dance studio. They don't necessarily just, you know, rehearse in the studio and then not take it home with them. So from when I, I mean, I was paired, I mean, I did 26 seasons of the show. I think I had mainly athletes, like for at least half of it. Mm -hmm. And I would see a pattern with them and see that they would study the choreography, come back, and then we would be able to work the detail. So the devil's in the detail, as you know, Mr. Corolla, when uh, during your time on Dancing with the Stars, which I just watched, and I was very impressed. Wow. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there on my podcast. We'll get there. Yes. And I should give the podcast a plug because oh. I'm going to do it. Oh, that's why he watched. That's right. Sex Lies and Spray Tans with Cheryl Burke and is available wherever you listen to finer podcasts. So anyway, back to me. Um, yeah, well, it struck me that you would have to, and I don't know, at the end, when you're getting into the, the final rounds there, how many hours a day are you rehearsing with these people? Well, you know, for us pro dancers, it goes beyond that as well because we have to choreograph. And I never right. liked to uh, show up there with uh, nothing empty handed, you know. And so for me, I have to plan everything. And sometimes they don't give you your music until they know you're safe. And then it's just like it's 24 hours, seven days a week. It's basically Survivor, but you've got, you know, shelter and water. Mm hmm. So like you and Emmett at the end were going hardcore. Yeah. How many hours? Yeah, I would say eight hours. But eight actually hours. with Emmett... He was very strict. He was, you know, he was married at the time. We were actually traveling back and forth from L.A. to Dallas. And this is when this was season three. So we had six weeks of training, which is a lot. And then we had a 10 week show and we would just fly back and forth. There were result shows. So and he only gave me four hours of his time because he wanted to be with his family. Mm. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't know what you I pitched this, but you can you can tell tell me. Okay. Um Certain people have different lives and different amounts of time they can invest in rehearsal. <laughs> yes. Like, so for me, I had a full time job and I had twins that were, you know, sort of newish born and a family and stuff. And, and I could give it a couple hours a day, but I really couldn't do what Christy Yamaguchi did, which is like move here from one of the <laughs> Carolinas and do 10 hours a day, you know? Right, right, right. Now she would have won anyway. Yes. But I've always said that, you know, in sports, they're trying to get parity. And so what they do a lot of stuff is they go, you can't have college football practice 10 months outside of the season. You know, right. you can have this many hours. And then they start making rules, like only receivers <laughs> and skill position guys can report. Even in high school, they'll have like seven on sevens, and they won't let you do two a days for two months. Right, you right, you right. know what I mean? Because right. they sort of, NASCAR will put restrictor plates on their cars, so they're all oh, sort of even. You know, you know what I mean? Like they can't have anybody building a super engine and pulling okay. away from everybody. Oh, that's interesting. I always thought Dancing with the Stars should be like at the beginning, the max is four hours a day you can practice or whatever, and then in the middle rounds we'll put it to six, and mm -hmm. then if you get to the final two, it'll be unlimited or and if something. you cheat, you cheat. Like, yeah. cause like a lot, I just had Bobby Bones on the podcast and he said, I would cheat. He straight up said, I would cheat <laughs> and I would rent my own studio when, you know, the four hours, cause there are rules since you were on. So oh, there are. Yes. So basically oh, there was wait, a lot I of, should get credit for this. Yeah, when you, did this happen? <laughs> this happened after all the injuries. So Jewel was supposed to do the show, but she uh -huh. got injured. She didn't even make it to the live show because mm. there was endless amount of hours back in the day, as you can remember. Right. There was like, you just put the schedule in. So if you're asking us, we're like 12 hours. And right. the, there's just no balance. Um, but then we had Nancy O'Dell who got injured just because your body's in shock mm -hmm. and you're not used to this type of um, movement in general when it comes to ballroom dancing. Oh, so now what is the rule? So it's four hours a day, basically only... Until maybe the semi, maybe the finals. I mean, it's only. I mean, it's only four. This is why people cheat. 
Oh. <laughs> There's no way in hell you're going to be able to put a live dance and performance together for 90 seconds with only four hours a day, including the interview process, right? Like you've had all those interviews, you had those taped packages, but you had come back, I think, for other seasons and did that. But still, it's time consuming. It's consuming in general. This whole show was my identity. It's the only time... Uh, the tape package things. That you had fun? <laughs> no. It's the only time I really went nuts on somebody. Oh, and gen- like actually? I yelled. I yelled at one of the producers like so long and so loud. It was, <laughs> oh, my God. I can't wait to hear this story. It was story. crazy. She was a youngish blonde girl, may have come from Florida somewhere. Nice. Okay. And... She kept coming around, and it, it was when I was doing my unicycle dance. <laughs> oh, you know? your pasta dough bite. Yeah, there it is. And she goes, uh, she goes, I want to get some B-roll. Are you like practicing on the unicycle? And I was like, for the intro or for the, pa-, you know, whatever? The package, and, and, yeah. and she goes, yeah, for the, for the intro or for the lead, the whatever. Rolling, and yeah. I go, oh, no, we're doing a reveal with the unicycle. Right, I'm going right. to come out on the unicycle. Yeah. And she's like. Well, yeah, but it'd be nice to have some B-roll of showing you on the unicycle, you know, practicing before the no. unicycle. And I go, no, no, it's a reveal. It's a reveal. So we can talk and we can talk about the pasta doble and all that stuff. But I can't. I don't want you shooting me on the unicycle. And she's like, I think people would enjoy that. And I go, I know they would. I'm sure they would. But I'm, I'm going to be in the wings in the dark and I'm going to come out. And pow, yeah. on my unicycle. So I wanted it to be a big reveal. Smart. And she's like, uh, well, I just think that people, and I got just listen. I we're think not, I know who you're talking we're about. Not fi- <laughs> we're not going to film the unicycle because we're going to do it with the big reveal for the rolling. Right. So she goes, okay. <laughs> then I'm like sitting down at some other day. I was, I was at home. I was in a bar at my house. And they're going, all right. And we're doing the interview. And she's OTF or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she's like, and can you tell us about the unicycle? And I go, Oh, is this for the post thing dance? No, this is for the rolling patch. I go, I, I, I don't want to talk about the unicycle because it's going to be a reveal. And she was like, what if we talk about just a little bit? I go, okay, hold on. Just, just hold on, everyone. Bit. I want to apologize to everyone. Shut the fuck up. Like, just shut up. Just shut up. You know what the fuck you're talking about? Just shut up. I don't want to talk about the fucking... I don't know why you can't wrap your mind around this concept, but go fucking do it and do it now. If you bring up this fucking unicycle again, I'm walking off this thing, and I just went... But the and people are not you again after no, that? No, <laughs> she, never, she never did, And uh, but she couldn't get the concept. I bet you the higher-ups were... Pushing her, probably, but mm, again, probably yeah. terrible instinct either way. Because there's no such thing as reveals there on that show. I don't. I believe. I, mean, I brought I, I pageantry yet. to the ballroom. <laughs> you definitely brought a lot of things to the ballroom for sure. Was the unicycle the craziest prop you've seen? Mm, you know what? It's never been done since then, and never was done before then. So it's like you actually, and it's hard. You know, after three thousand seasons of the show, it's like what can you reinvent at this point? And you did it. Well, they made a rule, which is no props after I did the I unicycle, mean, I think. But I may be... No, I thought it was creative. You know what was actually really impressive was your transition from the unicycle into the dance was flawless, my friend. <laughs> this Seriously. This day of my life. <laughs> it was, I mean, Why you were going to unicycle your ass out of there. Did yeah. you know that that was going to happen? Or did you have no idea about your elimination? Oh, no, I had no, I had no idea. But I'm always I'm always ready to go home. I'm <laughs> always ready to You're go packed. home. I'm so I'm always ready to go home. That's my default setting. I got a nice house and I work my ass yeah. off and I was doing morning radio, so I was getting up at oh five in the God. morning. Were you hard on yourself? Um when you lost? No, I I was like um I said to uh, Juliana uh Huff, that's who I had, right? Julianne. I'm oh, sorry, Julian Huff. Um, I just said, look, I got to get up at five every morning. I got newborn twins. I'm busy as shit. I, I got two hours a day. I'll be done with the radio show post meeting. At you know, I'll see you from noon to two or two right, thirty right. or something like every day. And then I'm going home taking a nap. So whatever we Good can get, you. whatever we can get done in two and a half hours, let's do it. But yeah, beyond that. I'm heading out. And that was actually pretty good for just two hours a day. Really? Not even four. No, no. I was always, it was, I, I said like right at the beginning, I just go two hours, 
I got a full time job. Right. I get up real early. I got yeah. family. I, I just I got two hours a day. We'll do it. And uh, and by the way, two hours a day sounded like enough for me. I used to play football. <laughs> Practices were two hours. Like baseball, every, every practice was two hours. You know, so I was like two right. hours. Well, and really, technically, with the brain, right? How much can you like actually absorb? Absorb. In I such- couldn't. And 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 Julianne was. She had one foot out the door by then. Mm. She was like, I'm going to be the next country star. I'm doing <laughs> movies with Alec Baldwin. I'm, like, I'm out of here, man. I am going to be the next. Yeah, for sure. So she was yeah. like, oh, you only want to go two hours? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, okay. <laughs> More auditions awesome. for me. <laughs> More auditions for me. I'm out of here. Yeah. So th- that's no, but, how it works. Uh, did you ever rehearse it? I mean, you had to have memorized the choreography, but you're probably naturally good at memorizing. I or? I. I started playing football when I was seven and just had people coach, 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 you know, do this, do that. Football was all like take a half step this way, then crack back that way. That's why the football players do well. Yeah. So and the plays, their mindset is tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. Not you're not the boss of me that every asshole didn't play team sports has now, you know, so. Football, it's everything in football is like the, the coach like comes in and goes, you're doing the wrong technique, Emmett. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to, you got to, you know, get in, get low, push up, crack back. You know, it's the counts on three, fade out this way and then cut up that, you know. Yeah. So that's all they do is yeah. take instruction. And good, and they actually retain the information and absorb it for some. Look, I've had some uh, football players that definitely was different from Emmett in, in a way, you know, uh, but... <laughs> but Emmett wanted to win, right? Well, I mean, Emmett, yes. But there's also diff- different generations, I think, too, with just like like you said, being able to like not put, involve your e- your ego was a big thing. And then when I, mm. you know, dancing with different personalities, it was fascinating. Like if I had to really, uh, I guess, put everyone in a little bucket here and bucket mm-hmm. here, it would be reality stars I loved because they weren't worried about the camera or being vulnerable in front mm-hmm. of the camera mm-hmm. versus like actors, for instance. I'm mm-hmm. not saying all actors, but I'm saying, you know, just in general, I married one, I just divorced him, but like <laughs> they seem to be a little bit, maybe a little insecure at times because they're not used to being themselves on camera, right? So when you're doing something like Dancing with Stars, you gotta be vulnerable or else what is the point of uh, doing this show? You're not here to look cool, put it that mm. way, in all those costumes, you know, shaking your uh, tits around. No, so it's like, I'm it's not <laughs> all over the dance floor. You know, well, yeah, well, what, it, what it is, is yeah. it's like, I, that's what it is. Cause I was like, I know I suck. I can't dance. I never danced in my life. Like I, I was, you know, played football. Then I did right. construction. You weren't a ballroom you know, I, I didn't even go. Night. I didn't know somebody who owned like a piece of hardwood floor, or parquet, <laughs> or like dance shoes, or my family. I, I've never even seen it. Make we'd make. I wasn't in a school play where you had mm-hmm. to learn two steps or right, anything. Right. So I was like, I'm going to make a fool of myself. You know, but that's out, what you did out it. here. That's exactly why I did it. I, I, I got scared. I remember thinking. I remember exactly where I was. I was I was done with my radio show. I was walking back to my car in the parking structure at, you know, 11 in the morning or something. And my agent called and was like, you want to do Dancing with the Stars? And as soon as I heard that, I felt a, a, a little <laughs> bit of electricity of fear. Interesting. In you know, stomach. that fear, yeah. that fear, it, like you're back in junior high and... Uh, Sam McKenna wants to meet you out by the bridge after school, ooh. and you, you get that little moment of like, ooh. yeah, that that Child, I had yeah. that exact feeling of fear, huh? And I was like, oh, where do you feel that fear? In your I body? felt it like in my spine. It felt yeah. like oh, a little electric. Like I remember going, oh, oh shit, and then I like paused, and and I was like, God, you're scared, aren't you? <laughs> and and I'm not. I, um, and I don't want to sound like a blowhard, that's, but that's I don't really get you, scared. I right. do tons of race cars and getting street fights and shit like that. I, I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up jumping off roofs and the swimming pools <laughs> and stuff. I don't and fighting with people yeah. like I playing <laughs> boxing and stuff. I mm-hmm. I was never scared. I'm never scared to do anything. And I was like, oh, I think you're scared, aren't you? That's good. You were aware of that. I mean, that takes some major awareness. And yeah, and then as soon as I knew I was scared, I was like, I'm in because I'm. Because it would be lame if I said this is lame or I don't need to do this or, you, or whatever. I'd that just yeah. be an excuse. It'd be when, an excuse because I'm scared. Time you felt like that, but prior or after dancing? Oh, that kind of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I flew into Burbank Airport yesterday. There was fucking 90 mile an hour winds <laughs> oh coming in. I gosh. thought the fucking plane was all over the place. Uh, I don't. You I don't really the, have fear. You're flying the plane. I don't get fear. I, I just don't. Right. You could startle me if you well, lit an M80 yes. off behind right. me or something. But maybe mask singer. Because oh. that's why you did that, right? Oh, that I mean, was just like, I'm going to be in this big avocado and no one's going to know who I am. And I, I, I wasn't nearly <laughs> scared. It, you'd much rather hide in an avocado than put on some real tight slacks. I mean, how the <laughs> hell did you breathe? I mean, a lot of the show, like the showrunner or the sh- people on that show definitely worked on dancing at one point, I'm pretty sure. Um, but when it comes to, s- you were singing, right? It wasn't mass dancer. So how was, how could, did you breathe? How could you breathe? It's hot in there. Uh, you know, when you're, you, no one can see you outside of the outfit. So you have to spend. It's a, like a, go to the bathroom like that? Uh, <laughs> I guess. Hollow I mean, you, no one can see you outside of the outfit. So Ever. Ever. So when you're on stage and you're on there for a long time doing like tech rehearsal and stuff. Oh my God. They have miserable. all these little people with hand fans and that just like push the thing and they start like oh pushing it through gosh. the air hole or whatever. But I'm always like, you're, you're too high or you're too low. <laughs> yeah. You're blowing, you're blowing, you're blowing air Not on my balls. Get it up, avocado. move it up. And they're like, they stand there and, they, and they'll shove like a straw through the hole, you know, oh and you God. can suck on some stuff. Oh, they're serious. Oh, they're serious. They're so serious. You have to wear gloves in a in a welding mask when you get out of the car and stuff. Nobody can see. They can't see what color you, have your, you your are. Your own trailer. Yeah, you have you have your own trailer. Can and you fit in there? Ev- like every time. Oh no. When you <laughs> it's can the avocado you have to wear, it. You have to wear it all the time. No, it's you. Fascinating. When you're transported, <laughs> you have to wear gloves. Uh-huh. Every. every piece of your body covered and like a welding mask and a hood over it and everything like that. Wow. Then once you get to your trailer, you can, you know, hang out in your underpants <laughs> and then you have to get back into the cloak to go to the fitting room. And then once you get into the fitting room, you can get into your, your outfit. Wow. And you shot at CBS where we shot dancing. Um, yeah. On Genesee. I'm trying Beverly to think. Yeah, I think I think so. All right, wow. let's not talk about me. Let's this talk about let's talk about you. Were there any? Were there any? Because I I'm, I have a list of all the people, all of your partners. Oh my god! It's, it's a, How long quite, you got? Quite a list. D.L. Hughley had to be a pain in the ass. I cannot. <laughs> I know it. I, I know. I. You know what I want to tell to all the pains? Are you guys friends? No. I don't dislike him. I just, I just realize he must be a pain in the ass. Why? Why do you think that? Because I have, I, Cat Williams told I, I have a spidey <laughs> sense. I just know the pains Clearly. in the ass. I just know the pains in the ass. And what I always want to say to all the Can pains in the ass. Can you just go through ass, the list and let me know which ones you think were pains in the ass? Uh, Let's see I, ha- I don't first. have thoughts on Drew Lachey. Okay. I am at Smith One, so he was obviously there to go. Ian Zuring just saw a guy fight some guys on mini bikes. So I kind of yeah. like I like that, but I realized he jumped out of the car first and started pushing them, so maybe he was a pain in the ass. Wayne Newton is a doll, at least when I interviewed him, <laughs> he was. He is. Uh, I do know that. Uh, let's see, did uh, go in Chris- order. Christian De La Fuente. That was your, that was your season. season. You must have fallen in love with that what? man. What? Did you fall in love with that man? His ar- he dropped me on my head. His arm broke on live television. Oh. But he was hot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, I don't know. On. You know, you know. I mean, whatever. Go ahead. Don't Keep pretend going like down. you don't know. Down down these guys. Come on. Maurice it's, Green. How did they not fall you know in love with is? you? I don't even know who Maurice Green is. He's, um, he's an Olympian runner. Oh. All right. Are you okay? <laughs> no, you're going to tell me. You have this se- spidey sense, so go for it. I don't know Maurice Green. Okay. I don't know Giles Marini. Giles Marini. Giles Marini. Tom DeLay. Don't know him. Politician. The Republican. Chad Ocho Cinco mm. could be a pain in the ass, but it's also kind of funny. You know? <laughs> to who? Uh, self-aware, maybe? He, he, does, he did some pranks. Did you say self-aware? Self-unaware. Oh. Self-unaware. <laughs> That's Rick Fox seems nice. Yeah, like uh, Chris thought. Jericho is nice. nice uh, he's guy. been in here a few times. Rob Kardashian, I don't have thoughts about. But Great guy, actually. Nice guy. William Levy. <laughs> I don't know who William Levy Tell is. Tell a novella. He's like the Brad Pitt. Oh, I got Alan. I know. I looked at an entire list of 26. So you only know three out of the 26. Uh, no, I looked at 26 people, and I looked at D.L. Hughley, Drew Carey. and I said. A, you missed Drew Carey. Drew Carey. Yeah. Yeah. What why, do you do you bring, why do you bring him up? He could. He's go- one of my partners. 
I, I, he seems nice to me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Deal Hughley seems like a pain in the ass. <laughs> and, and I don't know him that well. He just seems like a pain in the ass. He and was just insecure like everyone else, you know? It's just, it but is, you know what like, I want Insecurity brings out the devil sometimes. But you know what I want to say to all the people who are a pain in the ass? What, what's that? They think it's the other people that are the pain in the Isn't ass. That and I always want to say to them, I looked at a list with 26 people's names on it, and I got I to your theory. name, and I said, pain in the ass. And they went, bingo. How did that happen? Who said bingo? You did. I you said it with your eyes. Rewi- rewind the clip. You said it with your eyes. So I have a theory. DL was probably pain in the ass. Ray Lewis. Mm. Ray Lewis got injured. We weren't even on long enough. Okay. Mm. Well, my, well that, that debunks my theory. My theory Ray is Lewis actually these was are really the, nice. I played fit- 13 years in the league, yeah. never missed a game. Does dance with the stars, gets injured. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's it's yeah. rigorous. No, it's, I, I've t- this is why the rules. Mm-hmm. Same champion. Yeah. Because you, you usually place pretty pretty well throughout the season. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I definitely, I was never the one to go home first, put yeah. it that way. But which DL, great. you finished ninth. So I mean, we might as well have gone home first. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I remember um, we had a cha-cha. We danced to like apple bottom jeans. And he's like, that was a first dance. And I think, you know, it's hard. You put in a lot of work, as you know, Adam, or the two hours that you put in. But still, it's hard work on your mental state, too, because you're like, I'm going to look like an ass out there. And, you know, some people are not okay with that. And, uh, you not know, he, hard work with Christian De La Fuente. That was, I mean, he, I was dealing with a looking dude. I mean, I see beyond that. And let me tell you, <laughs> you can be good looking all you want. But sometimes it's just not that good looking when you when it's all said and done. You're dropped on your head from mm. him breaking his arm because he's mm. he. I told him don't work out. Don't play him breaking his arm. No, you should. This is great TV. He said don't work out. I said don't work out, and he worked out, and voila. Don't work out on top of your workout. Why would you do that? Why would you lift weights? Oh, because he's going to be sleeveless. No, it doesn't and matter. Lift ego. me. Look at him. Look. Look. He's busted look. up. Oh, oh. Here. done. 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 I was like, are you kidding? What did he do? Tear a bicep or something? No, he tore a ligament full on. And then, oh, and then yeah, when we... faked an injury. You should have. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I mean, I wonder how many times out of every one. Right, but how hot is this guy, Chris? Come on. God, doesn't that seem like it's black he's... and white TV? From... <laughs> <laughs> I know. It seems like such a long time ago. <laughs> so his man. ego got to him because he's going to do some curls at the gym, right? <laughs> Actually, he became a better dancer with one arm because he didn't break his leading arm. So like... Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, too many body parts get in the way. And when we decided, okay, the doctor cleared him to continue, he, we actually made the final. But I think maybe we got the pity vote. Who knows? So you told him, don't lift. I said, don't go to the gym on top of our six-hour rehearsal. Like, that's insanity. Right. And plus, as a dancer, you need to be longer and leaner, yes. more flexible. Mm-hmm. And hence why this happened. He was lifting weights. Mm, How dare I didn't him. know that backstory. But Why DL, were you working out on top of your dancing? No, experience? I went home, took a nap. <laughs> First off, what do you need to work out for? I just you just aerobicized for three hours. What what do we need to do? Go home and hit the treadmill? You know, I was like, no, I was sweating my ass off <laughs> as it was. It does, you know, it gets, you know. I think there's a lot of love found with the with the dancers because it's very intimate. You know, like the first time. Julianne, for you, I was like for the celebrities, not so much the dancers. I know we like we spank each other. We're like we're like football players in the locker room. Like for us, you know, touching and uh, dry humping isn't necessarily something that's new to us. Yeah, but I remember first, like, she's like, get your thigh in here, like tight, <laughs> yeah, like between so my legs, you know? And I'm like, oh, we're good, we are just <laughs> fine, you know? It's just you really got to get in, move it in, and <laughs> bring it in. in. And, and I was like. <laughs> Feels weird. <laughs> Felt weird to me, but I was like, all right. You know, <laughs> Can I have her hand this whole dance? Yes, yeah. if that's what the dance yeah. requires. Yes. Yeah, who, I'll do what uh, Keanu Reeves does yeah. when he takes a the picture. He does the yeah. hover hand. What does he do? Every I was, time I, he takes a picture with a woman... He, he he doesn't touch him. He no. He just hovers his hand like over their shoulder. Weird. Their That's yeah. the or worst very... thing ever. I was really? thinking about. I was thinking I'm so about it last night. The body language. That's ne- that's just horrible. I just finished doing six stand-up shows and I always go out and take pictures with everyone and I grab them and I pull them <laughs> in and great. I just go and give them up because it's fun, you know? Yes. But Keanu I was, was thinking about Keanu Reeves when I was doing it last mm-hmm. night and I was like, he's, this wouldn't fly with Keanu. Yeah, no. He Maybe he's like um, Howie just... Mandel. Maybe he's got that 
germaphobe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or is mm-hmm. it, his palms are usually like exposed. Like he will There's no. Uh, maybe he's got rabbing. clammy palms. Yeah. yeah. He, What's that? Somebody's kissing that him. Cameron so there's Diaz? like even when he just he's posing, doing the like, hover hand. posing with Wait, fans so and stuff. Wait, so someone can kiss his face, but he can't touch him. Who knows? It's very respectful. Wait, that's so. Now I'm going to start looking out for this. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's everywhere. There's plenty of. Pictures. Wait, that's so. Does Howie Mandel do that? No. Howie does. He's just like this. He's like, don't. He just sends <laughs> off horrible. Howie does the don't fist. Touch me. The fist bump. So anyway, DL douche. <laughs> all right, I got. It. I think you should have DL who, on. Who of all I of think your? We should do. Who of all of your partners took it the hardest when you were eliminated? Okay, well, there's a couple because we were all like. So the best dancer never wins. It's just the way it is, right? It's about, it's the people's champion. And for example, Bobby Bones won his season and I would dance with a a guy named uh, Juan Pablo de Pache. And we got like 60 out of 60. We didn't even make the finals. Mm. Um, And so, you know, that is hard because you're like, wait a second. But then me knowing how the show works, it's still hard because like we put in so much work. It's, it's seven, it is seven days a week and um, you always want to do your best and you can control what you can at the rehearsal space, but you can't control the votes. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a flawed it, system then. It's 50, 50. I mean, I don't, is it so much different than, you know, even a presidential election everything or anything? Everything is political. Everything, everything is, is political. Of, like if Taylor Swift went on Dance Go Starts, could she even lose? No, she didn't even have to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Coy, she could actually go and the take a piss in the floor. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. What did you think about that? Uh, I was doing shows, but we watched it. We went over the, the wreckage of it in here. And I, I'm i with, okay, I just, <laughs> I believe uh, we like Joe Coy. And, Same. and Same. it's a very, our people. it's a very hard job to do. And I think Taylor Swift, should have at least been nodding and smiling or some version of that. I feel it's, it's like, you know, do that thing where you're at some event or it's a, it's a, some event or something. And, and like, you may even, you may be with someone and not even know somebody or something. And they'll go, oh, we want to really give a, it really couldn't have done it without the sales team. And everyone like just starts, you know, just sort of claps. I just clap. I don't know the fucking sales team of is. Course. I'm just there for the free booze, you know. But I, I don't like the people who just sit there. Yes. And go, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not part of the sales team. <laughs> fucking clap it up, you know. Right. And when a comedian tells a joke and you're there with yes. your champagne, just do a little head nod. It's like a Catholic church. You're gonna stand up when everyone's standing right. up. Like it's just the That's way. That's right. Goes. Wait for everyone yes. to stand up and then I stand <laughs> up a and then I wait for them to sit down. Correct. And, yeah. You just do it. Yes. That's the way I feel. I hear you. And, and what did you think of his actual like the, his time on stage? I didn't. I was doing shows so in was, San okay. Diego, so Chris watched it backstage. It seemed fine. It, you know, it yeah. seemed like what it was. It's like yeah. you don't have all the time in the world. This yeah. isn't really. I think the backlash is your a lot stronger forte. than it needs to be. Is it true that he only got asked like a couple of weeks? I mean, even that, it's it was announced. Yeah, it was announced just days yeah. before. Interesting. But yeah, it's got to be scary. You know what I mean? Even if it's his thing that he does, he's also in front of the audience that he's in front of, and they got to be. Harsh, you know. That must be the toughest room for sure. <laughs> well, no one's gonna just laugh out loud. Oh yeah, I do stand-up shows You're with a bunch of faceless slobs out there. <laughs> right. I don't give a shit about. It. If I saw Martin Scorsese standing right. there, I'd be like, oh shit. Right, you know, you but know they I mean? paid to see you. Like this is not the same. It not not a good crowd. No. First off, most comedians would be like, oh, I'm not even gonna. They, you know what they'll say? They'll go like, I don't want to do the improv on Saturday night. It's always an industry crowd out there. They don't laugh. Uh, you know what I mean? They don't. Even, most comedians don't want to do comedy for comedians and actors and bookers and, and industry. They right. don't even. Want to, that's all industry. So I hate dancing in front of other dancers. Oh, you do. I hate it. Same thing. Yeah. I'm assuming. Yes, it's the, so. Yeah. No one, no stand-up wants to do comedy in front of an industry crowd. Well, that's all. That right. room is 100 percent industry. Like. When they say industry crowd, they mean maybe 10 industry people are there out of 150 people. But this is 100 percent industry. Would you do it? Yeah, I would. I would do it just because I'd be scared to do it. That's Mm. right. Did you feel it in your spine? I feel it in my spine. All right, Cheryl, let me give you a plug because then we got to do your podcast. That's right. right? Basically, we should just air this because it's all the same. (laughs) (laughs) Sex, Lies, and Spray Tans with Cheryl Burke. That's available wherever you find finer podcasts. I shoot her a tweet at Cheryl Burke as well. Website, Cheryl Dash Burke, B U R K. I'm actually not on Twitter or X anymore. Oh, well, then oh. we're going to just go to at Cheryl Burke on Instagram, though. That's fine. Do that. Uh, I'm going to be 
where? Grand Junction, Colorado, Mesa wow. Theater, coming up January 26th in front of a bunch of nameless, faceless dopes, not <laughs> industry types, doing two shows there. Uh, States Park. Oh, I think that's where they filmed The Shining. That's the really? Stanley that's Hotel. Park, yeah. That's yeah. so scary. I Estes could Park, never. sorry. Estes Park, yeah, where they filmed The Shining. That'll be fun, two wow. shows. That'll Creepy. be January 27th. Um, let's go to Ampcrow.com for all my live shows. West Palm Beach? I want to go there. Go. If you're anywhere around any you of those shows. You know who lives there? Um, the football player that I dance with. What's his name again? There we go. Ray. Damn it. Ray. Uh, oh. Ray uh, Lewis. Ray Lewis. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All the all the old jocks live live in Florida. Tax purposes. All right. <laughs> so you can go to Ampcrow.com for that. Sarah Tiana, her special 44. Cheryl Burke. Until next time, it's Adam Carolla saying. Thanks for having me. Mahalo. Mahalo.